Sean Cahill is a retired US Navy Chief Master at Arms. He's also an investigator and filmmaker. He was one of the key witnesses to the now historic USS Nimitz Tic Tac incident that occurred in 2004. Sean is a valuable and highly respected voice in the world of UAP and UFOs, and has had some truly incredible experiences. He also has a keen interest in meditation, and is fascinated by phenomena that reside in the space where science meets spirituality. As always, we've taken the time to create timestamps, which can be found in the description below. So, Sean, before the Nimitz Tic Tac events in 2004, what was your take on, on UAP? Before 2004, I really approached it as a, as, a, as a hobby or as an interest. It was something that was, that was entertaining and interesting to me. Um, I'd seen a number of UFOs in my life, but I didn't. Um, it wasn't quite an obsession. Um, yeah. it was just something I was very interested in. Um, but it's hard to explain because a lot of people say, Oh, when you say very interested, I say, yeah, but amongst a plethora of other things I was interested in. So it was one of the TV shows I watched and one of the, the number of books I read, but it didn't, uh, it, it didn't rule my life. I didn't put a lot of stock into it. I yeah. thought it was, uh, it was real, but, um, I had no idea what it was really about. Wow. So you said you had a couple of sightings already by that point so when was your first sighting that's interesting um probably goes back to very early childhood um i have a memory with uh that i shared with a sister of mine i'm the youngest of eight children and um it was christmas eve and she had come to my bedroom so i wouldn't leave the bedroom she, uh, because allegedly the boys were, my brothers were putting together a swing set or something in the yard, um, for me, but the reason she was in my room and she was really scared and she was telling me not to go out of my room because Santa Claus was there and I would ruin Christmas, but someone was running on the roof and she told me it was my brothers pretending to be reindeer. And it got to the point where we were she was physically restraining me at the front door. She was crying. Um, I think I got the door open and saw something and I'm not sure what it was. It, you know, I'm almost 50 years old now and the, the memories have morphed a little bit over the years, but as time went by, I was always looking at the sky and I would occasionally see things that people around me wouldn't see. I know that doesn't sound fantastic, but, um, uh, <laughs> but it was in high school um that i had a a sighting with three friends of mine while we were driving up a hill towards lick observatory in um mm -hmm. san jose california we had seen a large green fireball move across the sky and that's where that one that gets weird because we all have differing memories the three other people in the car have a very different memory than i do my memory says we went home and talked about it mm -hmm. and they said no i vehemently required them to go over the hill into the valley and up the mountain towards the observatory where we had seen this light. And then eventually we ended up at James Lick Observatory at some time around one o'clock in the morning and that I was running around the grass with these orbs. And the guys were in the car and they were frightened and I had lost my mind. Yeah. <laughs> I don't remember any of that. Um, and one of the guys won't talk to me about it anymore. So you would think that that would make it a lot more important in my life, but these events would come and go and I'd kind of just get back to what I was doing in my life. And it wasn't until I had gotten involved with, with some of the folks I've worked with in the last few years that they said, can you sit down and, and catalog what you remember? And the more I started writing down strange memories and events and then meditating and thinking about them and going back, I realized, you know, I've been, I've been having these experiences my whole life and then just kind of writing them off mm. into the subconscious. And, um, that kind of messed with me for a little while. Um, and then, then I went through a phase of searching for that kind of experience again, you know, trying to seek right. out synchronicities and looking at the sky obsessively. Yeah. Um, and then that kind of calmed down into kind of a Hakuna Matata kind of feeling of, of I'm just not going to worry about this anymore. Um, you know, granted, I still work in the field, but I'm not going to worry about my personal interaction with it. It's not causing me anything negative. Um, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. 
And I've been able to, you know, I've gone to therapy and, and talked to therapists about things and, and been assured that I'm not ill. Um, I'm just, ha I am having an experience that isn't, ha can't quite be explained. But um, I also think we're pretty lucky. You know, in 2023, we have a lot of things that we can look at to have this conversation, whether it's the Marvel movies or, or uh, you know, the woo-woo culture, as some people would call it, or the new age culture, which I think all those are used to degrade people that are just trying to figure out the universe we live in. Um, yeah. But it's it's been one of those. I've had the silver orbs here at the house and even photographed them. Um, the, the photographs aren't very compelling. Um, if you look at it, you could say it's any, any round silverish thing. Uh, yeah. it was hard to capture in the sky, but we knew what we were looking at and how it operated. And I don't know what that was, where it came from or who it is. You know, some people would, would like to say these are all government programs, but these, these silver orbs and some of these other things that are going on have been photographed and noticed for at least 75, 80 years, if not going back to antiquity, um, obviously not photographed in antiquity. But um, they're here, and enough people have seen them that it's it's not a it, it's it's nice to have a conversation where it's not an argument over whether you've seen something, whether it exists or not. I'd, I'd like to get more to the meaning, but I I can't find meaning in something that won't stop long enough and have a conversation. With it. Yeah, yeah, that's a bit of a challenge. <laughs> so you said these silver orbs, you've seen them around where you live. Yeah. When did that start? Has that been for a for a what like since you moved there or interestingly enough that's a pretty synchronistic event because and i've never mentioned this before on another interview but the night before the silver orb showed up i had uh, this was back in 2019 i had met um i had met the person who took over for luis elizondo uh for atip and then went on to lead uappf um and had a chance to speak to him and tell him my experience, my lifelong interaction with it. Mm -hmm. And that night I had received a gift. We were actually, and I I don't like, this kind of name dropping is what it feels like to me. We were actually at Tom DeLong's house at his birthday party. It's the only time I've, I've been to his house or really hung out in any fashion. And um, I, I was just there. There were a lot of other people there. Yeah. Um, but I was huddled in the corner with Lou and um, some of the people that were on set with us when we filmed Unidentified, and I was gifted a DLSR um, from one of the the cameramen who I'd become friends with. And and when he gave it to me, he and we it was kind of a trade. I gave him an old iPhone to use with his drone, and he gave me um, an old DLSR. His and he said, "You know how this works, right?" He goes, "You know you're gonna like you're gonna take a picture of a UFO tomorrow." And we were laughing because we'd had a lot of conversations about synchronicity and the way that that energy seems to, you know, gather these events toward each other. And we laughed. And then um, the next day we were, my wife and I were out on my deck and she was asking me, what are you doing? And I said, I'm just trying to figure out the camera again. I haven't used one in years since I was doing forensic investigations and things. So I got to figure out what, you know, F stop and all these other things. And I looked and she said, what are you doing? Do you think you're going to take a picture of the UFO today? And I said, well, statistically, yeah. I do. I think we probably will see something. We're laughing. And I was explaining that to her. And that was when over her left shoulder, I saw this glint of sunlight in the sky. And I usually start swearing around that time when I see something. I'll see. So if all the video or photographs, if, if they're live photos, you can hear me in the background constantly denying it and swearing. Um, but I started taking photos of the sky because and trying to zoom in and do other things because I still didn't, I hadn't used a camera in years. I was like, all I could do was put it on the little green auto thing and go. Yeah. So we got back inside and, and she and I, then we took a few photos and we watched it. She saw it, then she lost sight of it. And it kind of did this thing, did like a figure eight, a couple of times. And then it just took off Southwest and which uh, we're a mile from the beach. And it took off in the exact direction of the Channel Islands and the, the relative area that Guadalupe Island is is about 500 miles past. Um, but it, it was spec it, to me, that was spectacular because it was close enough that we could tell this was not a balloon. It, it was not it was it was a silver metal sphere that was moving in a fashion that it, it couldn't have done unless it was 
held by 20 people on different wires in different directions that were completely invisible. There was no prosaic mm -hmm. explanation for it. And then the way it took off Southwest, it was, it, it was incredible to me. Um, that reminds me that in 2005, and I forget about this one a lot, um, approximately, I don't remember, approximately four months after the Tic Tac incident, mm -hmm. I saw the, my first and only black triangle, um, a very large silent black triangle around 2000, probably 2000 feet in altitude came in from the east and came in slow over my neighborhood. So you were in your house. I was in my backyard um, playing an internet-based video game. It was near midnight. I was still wearing my my khaki uniform from work. I'd gotten home late from work, and mm -hmm. it just poured some coffee. It was probably I think I was chain smoking cigarettes and playing a video game on the patio. Um, in the dream. Yeah, oh yeah, you know, <laughs> just trying to decompress from the day. The wife and kids were already asleep. Um, I probably had a cocktail, but not you know not enough to hallucinate. Um, yeah. and I saw this, the stars starting to, I was, I'd finished the game, closed the laptop and was smoking and looking due east when I saw stars starting to blink out and I was trying to figure out why they were, I didn't see the, it was a very uh, clear night. Yeah. And at some point I realized what I, the, the shape of this thing and that it was almost, a almost a Vanta black in color. It was like, it was an absence. I, I couldn't notice texture. I just knew that it was black. It was triangular and it was slow and it was huge. It was at least three football fields across and it went straight over head. I ran down my, my yard has a long walkway in it that kind of goes downhill. And at the bottom of it, there was a table and I ran down that walkway, jumped up on the table to steady and broke off our umbrella that was on it. Um, and watched this thing tip on its side and, and shoot south also Southwest at wow. an incredible speed. And the next morning I was convinced the whole thing was a dream. I woke up immediately thinking about it and went right outside and there was the broken umbrella and everything. And I'm like, wow, that, I think that happened. I think I saw that last night. And I kind of filed that one away. Uh, TikTok, or TikTok, TikTok, excuse me. TikTok had been six months prior. And even though I had started to explain that in my head as a DARPA program, I was like, this must be ours. If, if, cause we didn't pay any attention to it. And we can get into the details of, of how that that happened, but I I was just I couldn't I just filed it away, kind of went back yeah. to work. There was nobody to tell. I wasn't I didn't I considered reporting it to MUFON or something like that, but at the time I was like, what's one more report of one more thing? And that sucks. People would probably give me a hard time as a, a UAP investigator to say something like that, but um. It's a lifetime of things like that. Something happens, I see it. It should have a bigger impact. And then it quickly yeah. fades away. Have you ever thought about why you seem to have multiple of these experiences? Like, because I personally, you know, I'd love to see something yeah. and I still haven't really been lucky enough to see something beyond any you know that i can that i can say okay i saw something that defies prosaic explanation uh, and i'm sure of that beyond reasonable doubt like i've seen some things but nothing that you know i could be certain of or that do you see what i'm saying but but you seem like yeah. you've had quite a few of these amazing experiences i would speculate and a lot of other people would um i'm not trying to wear any kind of martyr hat here but i had a very mm. uh very tough childhood um my mother passed when I was seven on Christmas Eve. Um, there was, there was a abandonment issues. There was, uh, physical abuse at times. Um, some mental, you know, men, like what we would classify as mental abuse. Mm -hmm. And so as the years went by, I developed a great deal of anxiety. Um, and coping strategies. Um, for me, the military was a coping strategy. Putting on that uniform and, and eventually being the chief became yeah. something that kept me safe from the world. And honestly, between us, when I would come home from work and take that uniform off, I wasn't the best person. Um, and then when I retired, that became apparent. That 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 dualism and personality became apparent to me, and so I had a lot of personal work to do. But I would I would speculate, as I think a lot of other people will, that that people who have had 
a lot of challenges in their life that may suffer from PTSD or CPTSD or have been through trauma. Um, it's almost as if those folks, if it, let's just say for a moment, we're using the metaphor of a wire that we're all, a, you know, a nice copper wire. We're meant to carry a, carry energy from one point to another and we're insulated from from all the other signals around us to a certain extent you know i don't i don't hear the electronics in my tv or the the electricity in the walls i don't hear the wi-fi or see the wi-fi um even though it's present here but a certain amount of my insulation over the years has been stripped away um that seems to reveal a minute percentage of our reality to me that might not be apparent to everybody else around me and whether it's pattern recognition or um you know reading a room Mm -hmm. that kind of thing um that kind of that 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 constant bombardment of information uh for a long time threatened to drive me nuts and then it just became something i i was able to kind of recognize and cope with and, and and utilize but I really do think that folk, it it does, there does seem to be comorbidities across the board with a lot of um, so-called experiencers and or witnesses that Mm -hmm. these folks have almost in all cases experienced some major trauma in their life um, that I use the metaphor of it that has stripped away their insulation and left them more, more open to these other frequencies, ideas, visualizations, whatever it may be. Um, and physics tells us we live in a very dynamic universe that has a lot more to it than we are perceiving in this moment. Um, and I'm not fully convinced in one direction or another what the origin of our reality is, whether its origin is in consciousness or consciousness is a product of, et cetera. That's always the big question. Yeah. But I've had enough evidence in my life that says that I'm, I'm non-local. I don't. I don't believe that this this body is my full self. Um, and so those those moments tell me that that there are other things in this universe that aren't always apparent or presented for our perception. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Wow. So before we move on from that, tell me about those silver spheres again. Mm-hmm. Um, like how frequent. Is that how many times have you seen something along those lines? And are they what you were? I've heard you refer to silver basketballs. Is that something yeah. separate? Yeah, that's separate. No, they, I, I, I call them the I call them the, the silver basketballs. Okay, uh, they do seem that they're probably larger than that. The one that was here, based on the distance away, it was probably fifteen to twenty feet in diameter. Yeah. Um, so obviously much larger Big than a basketball. basketball. <laughs> But it seems to be exactly what the fishermen around Guadalupe Island were discovering, or excuse me, yeah. were were, dis- were discussing with us. And they had really, no pun intended, close encounters with these, where they would be in their boat pulling lobster traps. And maybe 100 or 200 yards over there, one of these would pop up out of the water. And sometimes it would ma- it would make a noise, other times not. But it would pop up and it would be there and it would almost kind of turn and see them and then immediately translate right next to the boat like just almost instantaneously point a to point b and it would just kind of sit there for a second as if it was looking at everyone in the boat and these fishermen have had this happen to them enough that they're like that they laugh you know they're out there and they're used to it some guys are very scared some guys uh, some of the folks that we interviewed we're happy to talk about it. And there were other people that were in the back and, and you know, they would point someone out and say, so-and-so had this kind of experience. They just shake their head and say, I'm not talking to you. I don't, I don't want any part of this. And so it seems to, whether it's a, it's small enough. I don't believe there's a pilot. Um, that's just a guess. And, mm. um, and the way it's operating, if there is a pilot, they've definitely conquered, um or they definitely have the ability for it to dampen inertia um Mm -hmm. because the way that it was operating would would make anybody inside um you know plaster them against the wall if not but i it's not a technology we possess it's certainly not and it seems present off the coast here um you go to any of the channel islands out here whether guadalupe with the with the indigenous mexican fishermen or up at catalina 
island, et cetera, here off the coast of California, the residents will tell you the same thing. They see them all the time. It's very strange that it can be so known up and down mm -hmm. the coast from here all the way down to Ensenada. Any, anybody you talk to will have seen them, especially south of the border. But the, whether you're using the word government or, or city council or local constabulary or, or, or whatever, nobody seems to care except for people who are involved with UFOs or people who are seeing them. Yeah. Yeah, it's very it's frustrating, isn't it? <laughs> strange and frustrating. Um, and I suppose you would say that we're quite far from having tech that could do what you've seen them do. And and that would go for foreign nations and private industry, because obviously there's some pretty advanced private companies. And again, even if they could, even if we could do that now, people have been seeing these kind of things for a long time. But even now, you don't think that we, we could we could. I don't. Um, it it's evidenced by me in many areas. None, none of none of these examples are, are 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 large enough to prove any points. But when we look at what's going on in Ukraine, uh, and not to make this political or about the war or shift focus at all, but some of these mm -hmm. we've seen that the equipment being utilized by the Russian forces is not the pinnacle of military technology. We've seen that they're using old aircraft and they have over the counter yeah. Garmin GPS duct tape to the, to the, to the dashboard. And I'm, it, and the Chinese, whether it's these balloons, et cetera, you know, a lot of people wanted to immediately say these are UAP and, and, and therefore there's no such thing as UAP or UFO. And, um, that's ridiculous. And yeah. to, to see that, but, but at the same time, that's not indicative of their best, but the these. Pardon me, I, I digress quite a bit, but the fact is, is we're missing the fundamentals because the five observables speak of, of an esoteric science that we're nowhere near understanding. It's still at a science fiction level, far past us, and our greatest minds have been working to 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 crack these codes for anti gravity and and. Um, you know, whether it's anti-gravity or low observability, instantaneous propulsion, hypersonic velocities, et cetera, we can't attain those, but, but at fractional or and very brute levels, you know, we have hypersonic missiles, we have some hypersonic um, glide vehicles, but nothing that's going to make a, a left, left, right angle turn and nothing that, that moves instantaneously, nothing that, um, that can move in a in a intermedium fashion or transmedium fashion um our our craft as as many other people have said you know an airplane's a good airplane it's a bad boat a boat yeah. is not a good airplane you can make an airplane go in the water you can make a boat fly um but a submarine is a horrible aircraft it, it does you know so these things just move with impunity wherever they want and there are some cases that that claim that they move through the lithosphere or through rock the same way with the same ease that they would move through atmosphere or water. Um, other people speculate that those are holograms. Um, that enters the science fiction realm to me um, only yeah. because that that's, that's pure speculation. If you see an object go into a mountain, I, yes, let's speculate that it moved through the lithosphere, but I'm not going to speculate past that. I'm just going to say what, what we think we've seen. Um, these things are occurring. There's a great number of people in authority that want to say they're not occurring because they don't mm -hmm. want to deal with the fallout of a 75-year investigation that hasn't been made known to the public, that has been treated as something that's not worth talking about, that is constantly reinvented and then placed in the black and, and you know, nothing to see here. And then you've got yeah. people that have a cognitive block that seem to have something in their psychology that knows that if we start saying this is real, we're going to have to start really looking at other aspects of our reality that reveal things about ourselves that we don't want to know. To me, it seems that simple. Um, yeah. This, the presence of these craft, the way that they maneuver speaks of a larger universe, whether the thing that you become interested in is the idea of an other of, of a, a so-called extraterrestrial crypto terrestrial breakaway civilization 
But for me, one of the things that it says is there's more to the existence than just here and just now and just this. And there's, there's, there's rules we don't understand. And mm -hmm. I want to know more about that. I want to know where I was before I was born. I, yeah. I, my existence has told me I'm more than this physical body. When I had a heart attack back in um, 2012, when they placed my stent in my heart, I had what people call an out-of-body experience. I, oh, my really? consciousness went to the, floated up to the roof of the, of the room we were in, almost like I was a balloon, and kind of bounced along the ceiling. And I watched wow. the procedure of them placing the stent in me. And at one point during that procedure, something strange happened. And the doctor put his foot up on the armrest. It was kind of like a very um, intense barber chair that they would put you in for this procedure. Okay. Um, and they had they put in the catheter in right here into my artery. And that's that's actually the EKG of my heart attack. Um, oh, wow. But they put the catheter in my arm. And when it got up to my shoulder, my vein collapsed. And so to get the catheter out of my arm, because the vein had collapsed on it, the doctor had to put a lot of positive pressure on the line to take it out. And to do that, he braced himself by putting his foot on the armrest and had one of the other doctors holding on to him and very slowly extracted the catheter. Well, I watched all this from the ceiling um, wow. in these dusty blue rafters. And so at some point my eyes opened and they were like, well, chief, everything went great with your procedure. Um, <clears throat> now, however, your, your, um, brachial artery, artery, I think is what it was collapsed. So we had to go in through your femoral. So you're going to have, um, two bandages there, nothing to worry about. And I said, what, is that why you had your foot up on the armrest? And he, he, the doctor was like, what do you mean? How, what do you mean? I said, no, you, you were yanking on something. You had your foot up on the armrest, but I couldn't see what you were yanking. I said, I was watching you from the ceiling. And they kind of all looked around each other and called some more people over. And as I was coming out of the anesthesia, they had me tell the story a couple more times. And I saw everything they were doing. They were laughing. And we talked about it afterward in recovery. Um, but I'll never forget that. It, it was, yeah. there was, I could, it was one of those instances and I've read, 50 books on it, watched a thousand podcasts and other interviews on people who've had NDEs and OBEs. And that, yeah. I know it happened. And I was able to mm -hmm. prove it to myself and to the other people in the room. So that's that started my consciousness journey into trying to understand yeah. that. So that, that, but that's given me something that I've, I'll never put that down. I, I know yeah. what happened that day and I know what I've been able to do since via meditation or with my visit to the Monroe Institute. Um, and so I, I really do think that this subject is a very hard pill for a lot of people to swallow because of the deeper meaning behind it. Yeah, most definitely. Thank you for sharing that, by the way, that's well, fascinating. As you probably know, like I've spoken to a few scientists and doctors and stuff that deal with OBEs and, and NDEs, as mm -hmm. you say, and, and yeah, you had a veridical OBE. You had a oh, you, Dean Radin, who's one of your recent guests, has been yeah. uh, just incredibly important to a lot of what I've learned and a lot of the confidence I've gained. I, I fear a lot of people. I'm using an impolite term here, but I fear a lot of people go crazy with with this info and these experiences because they're not able to verify. They're not able to get that. Mm -hmm just pat on the back of confidence of someone go, no, that happens. We don't understand it, but you don't have to feel alone, lonely, or crazy about having experienced that there's a, there are places to turn to and there are experts working on it. Mm. Funnily enough, the, the person, the, the, the episode that I've released most recently as of us talking, not as of your episode being out, uh, it was with Jessica Colne. Um, mm. She's a research psychologist and she runs support groups for people that have been through or are going through spiritually transformative experiences designed exactly like you say for people that are like what what the hell do i do with this thing that happened mm -hmm. to me and like am i going crazy and and i think it was professor stanley kripner that said as well like um i normally ask my guests uh, for a, like a message at the end so spoiler alert you've got like a, an hour to think of that now um but he he basically <laughs> wanted to emphasize the fact of like if you've had an experience like these and if you've had something weird happen to you like you're not alone and you're normal and these things they happen and 
talk about it and don't be afraid and uh, yeah you're so right um there's so much in what you said that I could unpack like that <laughs> we could talk about just that like uh for the rest of the rest of our time together um we're going to circle back hopefully to the fisherman uh and the thing you things you've been doing with that um I'm going to have to circle back to asking you about your visit to the Monroe Institute obviously um in terms of that OBE like wow uh I mean that's just I mean you've you've laid it out really clearly and nicely so it's not much I need to ask you right now but what an incredible experience and you said you did speak to the doctors about it afterwards and and so you verified it for yourself so yeah you always have that like concrete knowledge of what happened to you which is incredible um I guess let's let's talk about the Nimitz and then when we're past that, we can basically get distracted by whatever we want and, and go off sure. on any little tangents here and there. Um, so before I ask you to kind of retell for the thousandth time that story, um, I think it will be valuable probably for me, but more so for, for people that are, don't know much about you or your story or anything like that. I think it's a good place to start to explain your position at the time, like your responsibilities. Mm -hmm. So you were a U.S. Navy chief petty officer and you were the the master at arms is it the master at arms yeah i kind of always think of titanic when i when i say that out loud you know it's like <laughs> fetch the master at arms because it's something <laughs> but anyway so just kind of give a brief a, just a brief idea of of those like what your position was at the time and your responsibilities and and what was that all about just to give i guess a little bit more context to put the experience in so I was stationed on board the USS Princeton as the chief master at arms. Um, it was November of 2004 during the Tic Tac event. And I had arrived on board in uh, June of 2004 and found out a few weeks later. I'd arrived as a first class petty officer and found out a few weeks, weeks later that I'd been selected um, as a chief petty officer. And so once that selection process began, began uh, what we call initiation, which is at the time, approximately three to four months long. Um, anybody who's been to college and has been through um, through rush week or hazing to join a, a fraternity or sorority will understand a great deal of what that initiation process was, but it was filled with heritage, learning, training. It wasn't all hazing. The hazing period portion that we went through had been tailored back and, and made more team cohesive building. So I, I don't regret anything I went through, but um, that period of time was very transformative. And by the time we got to November, um, I think was the first rest I had had in months. Uh, we had been pinned in in September, and so October and, and November were were filled with uh, with kind of starting to try to relax from from all of that hecticness. But um, a lot of people have brought up the fact that as the chief master at arms, as the sheriff on board the ship, it's un it's unusual that I was on the bridge. And some people think that 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 that's BS. It is unusual. Um, my uh, my department head was the navigator. And the navigator basically said to me, we had, we had gone to the Navy ball together, sat at the same table, had a few drinks um, and then went out to get some more drinks out in town afterward with our wives. And he said to me, I have a hole in the watch bill. I need to fill it. He goes, I know this is crazy, but can, would you be interested in standing watch on the bridge? I know you don't have a, a watch station you have to stand because you're the sheriff. And I said, actually, I, yeah, I will. I, I, my wife and I have been thinking about getting a sailboat. It's a great way for me to learn how to navigate and do all this other stuff. I said, it sounds like fun and it'll help me with, you know, be competitive with the other chiefs since I'm junior. And so I said, yes, and I immediately regretted it because it sucked. It was hours of absolute boredom. Um, it was not exciting. It ended, and then when it wasn't boring, it was terrifying. Um, driving a a guided missile cruiser less than a mile behind an aircraft carrier at, at thirty five knots while planes are landing and people are, you know, it's it's a crazy experience. Or driving another ship, driving your ship next to another ship while refueling. Um, yeah. For a guy who has anxiety and doesn't like heights and doesn't like fast cars and stuff like that. Uh, it was terrifying most of the time, yeah. <laughs> to be honest with you. Um, but I was up there and I'm a trained, um, I'm a trained investigator. I'm a trained observer. And like everybody else in the military, I'm, I'm a detail collection and reporting machine. That's what we do. We pay attention. We watch when we report to somebody who wants that information and has some level of control over our, 
our um, happiness and, and safety. And so we want to deliver that information to them. You know, it's a, if you haven't been there, it's hard to explain, but you, you're going to pay attention and you're going to give accurate information to your superiors or you're going to be taken out of that position. And um, so I was already adept at, at being an observer. And then I just happened to be there when we had an unusual circumstance going on. And I stood watch on board that ship for the remainder of my time there. Um, it was not something I was happy about. Once I did it, they never let me stop. Um, oh, really? But so you re regretted volunteering. Yeah. In there. yeah. <laughs> so I was I was on the bridge when I received a telephone call um, from Senior just to Chief cut Kevin you off, Day. just yeah. just to immediately interrupt you. Um, sure. So be before before that telephone call from from Kevin Day, mm -hmm. like just just take me back. Like, was there anything out of the ordinary in the kind of the couple of days leading up towards this? Actually, uh, actually, I didn't mean to enunciate that so much. Um, yes, there was. Um, so we were doing it. We were doing an exercise, a very mundane exercise running up to our deployment. But a couple of unusual things I think are worth noting to me. Number one, and this is this is highly pivotal to the to the whole case, was that we had recently upgraded the Aegis and the Spy 1B radar or the Spy 1B yeah. radar and the Aegis uh, battle system. Secondly, historically in an aerospace sense um a few hundred miles north of us i believe coming out of either i think out of vandenberg or edwards air force base was being tested um one of our hypersonic scramjets one of the very first test bed platforms of that technology and um i believe that a portion of that test during that period was successful even though we ended up lose, losing the vehicle um down range but i think that those those things are um are pivotal to this because we were we were right there where these objects were mm -hmm. and there were there were very interesting things going on in the in the general local area with as far as human technology goes so yeah. i've always speculated that of course they may have been interested in our presence in the local area where they were but i also wonder if they were monitoring those those experimental launches because if we had achieved hypersonic flight that day that'd be that'd be a benchmark for us um so i think those things are worth noting yeah yeah that's really interesting um okay so so go back to where were you so then you're you're on the are you on the bridge at this point you're on the the top of the ship when kevin yes. day calls you up i was on the bridge and i'm pretty sure because i think i do recall being the one that answered the phone um i was leaning it's against e sorry it's it's evening morning afternoon oh it's just... it's nighttime i was um nighttime, i believe yeah. that i think our watch bill was set up where we were kind of standing the same watches over and over again okay. uh we didn't we didn't like it uh we had an even amount of watch sections so you kind of just show up at the same time and i was standing the night watch um from midnight to 4 a.m or no excuse me that night it was uh 2200 to uh 10 p.m to 2 a.m yeah and uh I was leaning against the chart table, just talking to the to the quartermasters, the guys who do the the navigation. We had a small box we were able to maneuver in. The helmsman had his orders. It was very low key for us on the bridge. We weren't involved with the active aspects of the exercise or the or the the um, simulated combat that was going on. We were just mm -hmm. keeping the ship in this box. And my general orders from the captain were, "Don't wake me up." So stay out of the trough, you know, dr drive it properly. So we're not rocking all over the place. Um, so it was very low key. And I, when I answered the phone, Kevin was pretty excited um, and subdued. And he asked me to, you know, that was, that was when this happened every day. I'd get a phone call from Kevin when I got on watch and he'd reiterate to me, this is what we're doing. This is what we're looking for. And he said, we've got these contacts. We don't know what they are right now. I think they might be a ghost in the in the system, but do me a favor, have all of your your lookouts because I was in charge um, as the officer of the deck of all of the lookouts posted around the ship. They're there to, in case anyone falls overboard or to look for enemy vessels or uh, yeah. numerous other things. So I briefed all of them to keep their eyes out for air contacts. But it's you're already in an environment where you're going to report everything you see. So this is yeah. just. Keep your eye, you know, just kind of a, a double pat on the Extra back. Extra careful. Yeah. Yeah. So it wasn't something I was super excited about. I went out on deck, took a look around. Nothing looks unusual. Go back to it. And we did this over a course of days, but um, it got a little bit more and more tense. 
And I finally, um, I was like, what are we looking for? You know, some other people were coming up to the bridge and asking questions. And then one night, um, towards the end of the, the exercise, Kevin called me and he was, he was obviously stressed out, um, at a level that I wasn't. So I was taking him seriously. I was listening to him. Um, but he was pleading with me. It's like, please tell your guys, go outside and look for these things. Um, and I said, what are these? And I don't know, man, we're just, you know, look for contacts, um, in in the water out of the water in the sky um just have them keep report any contacts they see i said roger that and he said will you, will you please go out on deck and he was he was pleading with me as if i wasn't doing my job and I, he's like would you please go out on deck and just and just talk to these guys and i was like okay kevin fine i'll i will go hold all their hands and tell them how to do their job you know i was being sarcastic with them. Yeah. and i went out on the port side and talked to that that watch stander and started scanning with my binoculars he was looking through what we call the big eyes which are just a giant set of binoculars on deck that are that are mounted there and i was scanning from um the port beam up to the to the port bow and about the time i got to the port bow my uh, binoculars filled with with light and i dropped them to see what was i was i looking at and what i saw were five to seven lights in the sky um and they were all moving towards the center portion of their little grouping and it, mm -hmm. they would like almost like they were going down a funnel. One would like start its little descent down what looked like a funnel and then it would disappear. That there was some sense of movement, but there was no flash. There was no, you know, elongation like in Star Trek or, you know, there were no effects like that. Just very bright point point source lights with no other color around them um, moving toward in a circular pattern towards the center and blinking out. And I watched all of them do it. And then I turned to the to the kid that was on watch with me. And I said, with saltier language, I said, did you F and see that? And he replied to me the same way that he did. And we just kind of stood there for a minute, incredulous. And as we talked about earlier, the, 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 everything changed kind of. Like I went inside. I looked at the clock. I looked at the phone. I thought about calling Kevin. And I realized, well, he's off watch now. The per I don't think the person standing his console is going to care about this because no one else has called me. I was like, yeah. I'll just talk to him about it in the morning and tell him what I saw. I went about the rest of the, the night on watch and went to sleep. And when I got up in the morning, um, I went out and grabbed a cup of coffee and sat down. And there was Kevin and the other chiefs that I would talk to each morning. And Kevin was was leaned back with this giant smile on his face. And he's just looking around and he's really excited. And I'm bleary eyed and everybody else is kind of smiling and stuff. And I'm like, what are we, what's going on? I was like, Kevin, what the hell did you have us doing? What are we doing, man? What are we chasing out there? <laughs> and another chief tells me to go check my, my email on, on the zipper net, the, um, the secret, com uh, secret computer in our lounge in the back. So I was like, what? And nobody would talk to me unless I went and checked my email first. So I said, fine. I grabbed my coffee. I stood up and went in the back. And about five people came with me, Kevin and a couple of other people. And I pulled up the email that they were talking about from our, our department head, or from our, um, our operations officer, Commander Elders. And I start reading the email from the top because I'm kind of a conscientious jerk. And they're like, scroll down to the bottom and look at the video. And I said, not until I read the rest of this stuff. I know you jerks. You're going to you know, make me yeah. go back afterward. So I'm reading, I'm scanning through everything and I'm like, okay, okay. So these were UFOs. We're really looking for UFOs and I'm scanning down and I'm, I'm reading all these conversations about temperature inversions, seagulls, chaff, ice, ice crystals. These that are, are highly educated Annapolis graduates um, are, are working it out. They're fig they're trying to figure this out in real time and they're doing a damn good job of it. And that night before, Kevin had convinced the captain these were real. We, since we're the air defense commander, please sortie F-18s out there and investigate. And they talked back and forth with Nimitz, and eventually, that's what happened. Commander Fravor and Commander Dietrich were the first to arrive. Um, I think uh, Chad Underwood was another one of the people uh, sent afterward. And I don't know everybody's name, but they returned with that gun camera footage that, in my opinion, has changed the world. Um, yeah. We knew what we were looking. We knew that what we were looking at was not ours, or was not something any of us had ever been briefed on that we had ever seen. We knew immediately by looking at it that it was exhibiting um, flight characteristics that were not 
um, within our arsenal. There were no control surfaces. We were looking at something that was cold on the infrared. Um, there was no exhaust, and the exhaust should have been very hot. So this was a very unusual item. And you've got all these debunkers out there that have that are making a name just saying no, and and then yeah. bringing up very silly straw man details and 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 things like that. But the fact is, is there's no expert who has looked at those and thinks that we're looking at a prosaic balloon or seagull or anything like that. So we knew that then. And and you're, you're five trained professional career war fighters mm. smiling at each other and just laughing. Like, yeah, what the hell is that? Like, the, And we were saying, we said there in that moment, this is bigger than Roswell. This is the smoking gun. And a couple, one of the guys went, ah, BS, it's DARPA, you know, because that was his opinion. And a couple of us were like, no way, man. I don't, I don't think we've gotten that far. If we did, we win. We win everything. Yeah. I'm like, the yeah. global war on terror is going to be over in a few weeks if, if this is ours. You know, we, we were laughing and joking. And that was it, kind of. We had the operations intelligence briefing that evening. And though I was asked to stand at the door in case anybody, who was turned away for having a lapsed clearance um, gave the, the, the petty officer at the door a hard time and no one did. We turned a couple of people away, but they were happy not to attend another meeting. Um, we got inside. Uh, we started the PowerPoint. Pardon me. Stop. We started the PowerPoint presentation and a little cartoon alien went across the screen. Remember, this is 2004, so really, really low quality uh, PowerPoint. And um, the captain, uh, laughter erupted in, at the intelligence briefing. And a lot of the people in the room were confused. They were looking at each other asking. So we took a minute to kind of inform everyone once the, the murmuring died down. The captain yeah. said, well, we had a lot of fun this week. We had some, you know, some interesting things went on, but we'll just get back to work. He just kind of brushed the whole thing off and. There was no Q&A, and um, that was the last that we had heard about it at all uh, from the chain of command. It wasn't until 2017 when um, I got a phone call from a, a – I was retired, and uh, a friend of mine who was still on active duty, a Master Chief Petty Officer, called me and said, Hey, man, that, that incident that you told us about off the coast, it's in the New York Times today. It's, they said mm. it's, it's being reported, and there's that video you told us about is is in the article and i immediately what was your first when you first heard that yeah what was your immediate like response your... i got scared yeah. i felt a feeling of foreboding why 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 now um mm. and i don't like when other people go why now i feel like it's actually a really useless question and most most times <laughs> you ask it it's just it's because something is broken in our brain we're like why is this happening at this moment um but as I as I under as I read the article, um, and as I started to understand what was going on, it made more sense to me. But at first, I I thought I was scared that someone was going to know that I was involved. I didn't know if I wanted to be involved. I didn't know if I wanted to. I went came inside and I said, I don't know what to do. And my wife was like, Why do you have to do anything? And I said, Well, I was there. I said, I know what happened. And yeah. over the course of a couple of days, basically, I maybe a week. I, after about a week, I finally sent an email to Lou Elizondo at To The Stars Academy um, and said to him, I was present. I was on the bridge during these hours. I can tell you these principles were involved. You know, I, I named names. and was like, basically, I was saying, if, if, if anybody's telling you anything beyond the following general details, let me know. And, you know, I'll help you. I was there. So if anybody's full of it, I'll help mm. you call out the the charlatans basically. And, um, it was pretty clear that, that Kevin and I had reported exactly the same event, you know, when given a chance and, um, the majority of the other people, all of our, um, our eyewitness testimony corroborated. Um, so that was nice. There was nobody, you know, the, there's difference of opinion as to what we saw. There have been people, um, who've made offhanded comments about, one group of people from one unit or another. I don't, I don't, that doesn't bother me. Um, we're military folks. We're, we're critical. Um, and we're, we're, as I said, we're pattern recognition machines. 
we take in data, we report on it, and we take action. So I don't blame anybody from having it for having a perspective different than mine. Um, it's it's been really strange in the in over all of the years going through all of the different emotions surrounding it from not believing uh, from believing it was from first believing it was probably aliens you know in the moment to as time went by and seeing no response from the chain of command or the military it seemed well, i thought well it must be ours if we're not worried about it um and then i kind of put it to bed until 2017 and that opened up a floodgate for me um between 2015 and 2017 i'd been studying consciousness and meditation and things like that in, in my private life but i wasn't paying any attention to ufos or aliens or things like that and so after after lou went public it took about nine months before he contacted me and i, I was pretty surprised when he did actually and we talked for about an hour on the phone he said How, would you be interested in, in us coming out with some cameras and talking to you um and so we did that it was a lot of fun um we met each other that night on the pier and had an interview and when I took the, when we got done, when I took the mics and everything off, um, I said to Lou, I said, are you for real? You know, are you another one of those guys that's coming out of retirement and wants to, wants to make money and go on TV and do all this nonsense? And he said, no, I'm for real. In fact, I'm going to Mexico in a few weeks to investigate this some more. Would you like to go with me? And I said, I would absolutely love to go with you. And that, that kind of started our friendship and, um, and our, our professional um time together but i had to kind of immediately accept that this was real um yeah there were there was no break-in period it was obvious i was sitting next to the person who ran the program we had hours in the car on the way down to, to ensenada and then we i was invited to following that we call missions following that mission we actually then went to guadalupe island um so Sorry, my cat is going crazy, and so is the dog. Why don't they come and join us? Yeah, I think they're going to have to. <laughs> there we go. Come say hi. Hey, buddy. There we go. Hey. <laughs> when was that, by the way? Um, the the when that was straight away after it all came out in 2017 that Lou asked you to go to Mexico. That was in the fall of 2018. Okay. Because I didn't hear about that until recently. Does, was that like kept under wraps on purpose, or no? It was. Uh, we filmed it for the unidentified. Did I television just somehow? Trip. Oh yeah, I don't really get the same TV, do I? Being yes. in France, like I miss out on a bunch yeah. of the season. <laughs> so unidentified is is literally season one and two are literally Lou's show, basically Lou and Chris Mellon. Yeah, where they they invest. You know, they they're bringing it to the public. A lot of the rest of us know more about it, but um. But yeah, it was all on there. There's a lot of things people don't realize because they haven't seen that. We take it for granted. Like the Italians shot depleted uranium rounds at one and hit it. And then yeah. it in turn burned out the rotor on it, shot their rotor with an energy weapon and crashed the, the helicopter. So people think that kind of stuff isn't happening, but it is. It's just not, not being reported. You know, yeah. um, they're very, people are very reticent to discuss firing on UAP, except for the last couple of weeks. But, um, yeah. All right. So we were, uh, so I got invited down. So after Ensenada, we also had a secondary um, mission where, where we went to Guadalupe Island. But as I was saying, I, I really had to, in real time, come up to speed with the fact that this was real. And so I asked a million questions. Um, and it, I had, this was 2018. And that was the mm -hmm. first time I had heard of the five observables. And Lou sat me down and explained those to me. And immediately, there were some follow-on conclusions from the five observables that told me, that just told me reams of information that if, if these are traveling at hypersonic velocities with instantaneous acceleration, all these other things added, that, that these are definitely not us because they have cracked some fundamentals in physics that we haven't even come close to. Um, whether, you know, as we discussed earlier, whether inertial, inertial dampening or 
or, or, or any, any of the observables, to be frank. I mean, we might be able to do one of them and a fraction of a couple of others. But those fractions of our ability to get there are in the laboratory. And they're involving hundreds of thousands of dollars of equipment and interferometry and other things like that, to, just to show that we can duplicate the concept. But the energy levels that we're that we are duplicating some of the five observables at are at exponents so much lower than what have been observed in the field. Um, that I truly believe that if there were a terrestrial state actor you know, a, 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 a human government here that had control of the five observables. I, I do truly believe that they would probably have taken over by now. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard to see a world like with the way the world is at the moment, like how, you know, the, the, we love conflict as humans, apparently it's hard to yeah imagine that any government wouldn't have done stuff with it. And the same for private company, like they either would have done something with it or they would have sold it for a few billion or trillion to a government. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. There's no world where that kind of technology, if we had it available to use freely, it just sits and gathers dust or just pesters Navy doing training exercises. And well, and unless it's a simple, uh, my, my fear is that this fundamental that we're missing is simple. And, and that's why these things have been kept secret is because we do know human nature. And, and, and let's be frank, whether, whether you're the greatest fan of, of, a, of a specific country or government or not, most of us can agree that there are terroristic organizations, bad actors, people who would utilize technology to harm others or to project power and take over. Um, mm. I don't want that to happen. And, and if it is, if it turns out to be an over the counter type of solution, I can understand why these things wouldn't be available to everybody, but that, that speaks to how much we have to grow as humans. That if, yeah. if, if the technology exists for us all to be safe, happy, healthy, fed, etc., And, mm. but we're not mature enough to share that with each other. Um, I hope that's not the case. No, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's a whole other road we could go down with that, you know, that kind of line of thinking of like, what, yeah, what would happen if, if, if it, yeah, what is the wrong hands? And th there's already so many failings that we have, like, even in the countries that we consider the good guys, right? Like, uh, we're, we're so far off from where we should be in terms of looking after the vulnerable and looking after people and focusing on quality of life and, and things like that as, as, yeah rather than profit or what have you um or control have you thought like do you go well, into what you think they might be like or do you just kind of i don't i don't you know necessarily that they're not from much. here per se um i actually okay, I i'm, you, I'm yeah, more yeah. i'm more human. yeah i'm well i'm more in, i'm not even sure if i'm willing to go that far I'm, i am more fond of not saying us. They, <laughs> yeah not no email address and don't pay their taxes let me put it that way yeah uh, they're not yeah. i don't believe they're beholden to any authority structure we may have here i have a feeling we, we probably share dna but i have a feeling we probably share dna with everything in the universe because we share dna with everything here on the planet um and it seems like everything in the universe runs on a on a on a on fractal rules so i don't i don't think we're going to find as much variety as science fiction might uh might speculate at but what what the five observables tell me and what um, even keeping so-called abductee testimony out of it, the five observables tell me that, that these, if you have a UAP that can exhibit all five of the five observables, in my opinion, you have a time machine. And if other dimensions just, of ex go, please. Sorry, just to interrupt yeah. you. Yeah. Just, just briefly for anybody that's not so aware, the five observables, that's what they, you're going to do this quicker than me, but it's what instantaneous acceleration, low observability, transmedium travel, um, hypersonic velocity, uh, hypersonic velocity. And I always miss and one. the fifth one's going to escape all of us. Yeah. <laughs> transmedium travel hyper. Okay. Um, instantaneous acceleration, hypersonic velocity, transmedium travel, low observability. I don't know why we can't remember the fifth one and another one <laughs> i always forget the fifth one uh we'll remember yeah. it at some point but they 
what they indicate is, first of all, instantaneous acceleration um, has a hundred problems with it, whether killing the crew, breaking the machinery, um, yeah. ex- breaking physics. Um, the, the hypersonic velocities are, are, as I said, something we can duplicate, but only in a ballistic fashion. We can basically mm-hmm. shoot a bullet, but we can't turn that bullet and we can't make that bullet go in circles or go up or down or, um, or stop on a dime or stop on a dime. And some of these things, in my opinion, indicate, especially in the, in the instantaneous acceleration that there's a bending of space time going on. That's as far as I'll go with that because I'm not a physicist, but it it really tells me that there's, there's an in-between that I think signature management. Is it something about that? The the fifth one? Yeah. Oh, well, I thought that was low observability. Maybe that is the same. Maybe, maybe. Sorry, carry on. (laughs) Oh, it's so funny that we can't, man, I used to take them from the ground up and and I had a whole mnemonic to remember how they went. Um, Transmedium travel says that you understand, you understand the local structure and pardon me for sounding woo woo with this, but of frequency and vibration because Mm -hmm. they're vibrating essentially through these mediums at, at some kind of resonant resonance that, that makes it so they don't disturb the medium. And, um, Lou and I talked on on a different show one time about a knife through butter. Um, a cold knife going through butter is, is pushing butter aside via a wedge, a hot knife going through butter, a certain amount of it is actually creating a, a small wave thermal wave front. That's pushing the, the butter out in front of it. Yeah. And these things seem to move through air, water, and, and perhaps even the lithosphere, as I've said, like a hot knife through butter. They, they seem to move it out of the way and, and heal it behind them, for lack of a better word. And those things all speak of something so far beyond our abilities. And they also speak of, of a structure to the universe, in my opinion, that's a little different than what we understand. So, yeah. I think that as far as origin goes, everything's on the table. These could be extraterrestrial crypto breakaway. I mean, you could possibly apply everything to them. My question is, is really, though, now we get into the abductee testimony. And it, it's highly mm-hmm. unfortunate how little we can do with that because, and this is going to, this is going to anger some people and, 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 Folks should not self-identify or let this make them angry. But there is mental illness involved in this category. And there is there is and human failings in our ability to, to, to weave stories and to tell mistruths or to, to put an analytical or emotional overlay over an event. Um, mm-hmm. Those exist. And so we have to be really careful because you're dealing, first of all, with people that have dealt with some, that have seen something that may be extraordinary, that may be traumatic. And how they've responded to it, how they've collated it, and how they remember it is probably going to be different in every situation. But the first thing that we can do is say, this is happening. We don't ha- we can destigmatize this and say that this is a reality. Now, we're just so judgmental of each other. Yeah. We're so ridiculously judgmental that another person can have had an experience that has 99% similarity to ours and that one percent is going to sour us to not give them validation so Mm -hmm. let's start at the very foundation of it this is real something observing the five observables is here not built by what is perceived as human government not operated by them let's just go find out what it is yeah it should be that simple but instead we have a lot of people arguing about what it might be or whether it exists or not. And it seems simple. It almost makes you wonder if there is something involved in this that inherently makes it hard to deal with. Yeah. I guess some people maybe get ahead of themselves, right? Like I probably do it sometimes too. And I'm like, okay, well, I know something is going on. So let's try and speculate about what it could be. But you're right. The the majority of society is is still at this. They're not quite at the, okay, there's something here. There's something definitely happening and most people are yeah they're still looking for prosaic explanations or saying oh maybe you know or maybe it's u.s government tech or you know black projects or what have you so yeah i think 
yeah it's an important point because there's also there's so many speculations that we could have we could do that we could do a three-hour call and just speculate about what could it be and it'd be fun and and we could have a few drinks and and come up with loads of crazy ideas from a, a small section of the ancient egyptians that managed to survive in a cave and then became super advanced and you know we um, could pull 10 different very enjoyable takes on the origin yeah, of this totally different as well which would all be mutually exclusive as well that don't take each yeah. other into account there's a great deal of tunnel vision a great deal of ego um yeah i have some friends who really enjoy certain areas and aspects of this and think that that these folks have the right message but an example of, of where it falls apart is i say yes but they're but when you go back to the origin the person who presents all this information believes that they're a messiah i'm, I'm like we can't we can't dip our toes in that kind of stuff because if if we're going to take one person who claims to be a messiah at face value and i don't mean this in a rude fashion we need to empty out the the asylums and get all of the messiahs out and just yeah. just let them fit you know I, i'm i guess i am being facetious because this is one of those subjects where when you try to make progress in it there are far more people lined up with with cherry picked details trying to shut it down than there are people trying to find the pragmatic truth and i yeah that almost fascinates me more than anything mm. it is interesting i find that bizarre on, on like twitter and things like that there's there seems to be a bigger group of people who well they call themselves skeptics and stuff don't they but they yeah will nitpick every little thing rather than stepping back and and saying okay this does seem bizarre let's try and figure out what this is like I and they could even say, you know, my brain struggles to comprehend the fact that this would be something non prosaic, but I'm open to the possibility. Now let's dig in and and you know, I feel like they, they it just we've just gone past that. Skeptic doesn't really mean skeptic anymore. It means like yeah. debunker or as Stanley Krippner that I mentioned earlier it would say scoffers, mm -hmm. like people that just scoff at the idea of something just just can't be true, so it isn't true. That that kind of vibe. I have to say that I am triggered when people say, I'm just asking questions. Um, <laughs> I'd, I'd much rather have someone say, I'm just attempting to answer questions. I, I, there's plenty of questions out there, but if you're, if you are only asking questions and then looking around to see how much support you got for your sarcastic question, um, you haven't moved yeah. anything forward. You know, it, it's the constant straw man arguments, the kind the, the, what about ism, um, it's unfortunate, but it's it's almost like to have to make progress in any social issues these days. It's like you have to to get the whole cadre together and find some common ground for them to agree upon. It's like we, we're speaking the same language, but we don't use the same words anymore. Um, mm. We're we're polarized to a point that you can almost read the playbook of all the people involved um yeah and the level of manip and when you see it like that you realize how influenced and manipulated people are and how easily polarized they are um mm -hmm. i i dare say that the uap subject is probably at the pinnacle of our sociological issues our cultural issues. I do believe that whatever this is, it is, it is not this anomaly appearing on the radar. I believe that it is a part of our environment. And until we recognize it as, as a part of our environment, as a nat, as a natural part of our reality. Um, yeah. I don't think we're, we're going to get any closer to understanding it or ourselves. Yeah. It's going to keep chasing our tail mm -hmm. around and around yeah yeah again we could talk about this for a long time we could we could dissect all of this um let's let's go let's move on a little bit um and just to finish off on the the mexico stuff mm -hmm. that you're doing with mm -hmm. with lou luis um i heard you mention somewhere else about i mean we talked about the spheres and stuff mm -hmm. that these fishermen told you they were seeing like regularly um i think you also mentioned that they and again, I this some people would hear me say this and they'll be like, oh, see, that totally detracts the credibility from this topic. Mm -hmm. But but we have to be kind of open to to hear things, people hear people's experiences, even we don't need to put a label on it. But I heard you mention that they said they've seen dragons. 
Um, that was their description. Or something to that yeah. effect. Um, yeah, yeah. So there was a fleet of uh, either shrimp or squid boats um, and of a family cooperative. So each of the captains were, were related. I think they were cousins. Um, and there were about, I, I want to say, three or four of them traveling in company with each other and heading out on their way from Ensenada off the coast to where to where the fishing grounds were. It was late at night. Um, the only people that were awake were the were the 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 helmsman on each of the ship, maybe a lookout or an engineer. Uh, everybody else was asleep. And I remember um, these two guys were cousins because he was calling him Primo, and he, but he was calling him across the radio and he's saying, "Do you know there's something underneath your boat?" And he said, "There's something underneath your boat too." And he, he said, "What do you mean?" He said, it, "It's." They were describing them. At, they said they looked like dragons. Now, when they said that, I we got deeper into it. They didn't have eyes or you know things like that, but they were they had yeah. numerous. I'll, I'll say rainbow colors, and they were undulating. So it doesn't mean they weren't machinery or something like that. You know, um, they could have also. Excuse me. It doesn't mean that they weren't some kind of um, you know chromatophore squid some mm. some deep sea yeah. creatures we don't understand or something like that it could have been a completely unknown prosaic thing but they followed these boats and, and both of them were describing them um swimming underneath them they were larger than the boats they were keeping up with the boats and then at some point they they took off and one of the captains was terrified and the other one had to keep, was telling him, we just had, you know, just keep going, just keep going. We, there's nowhere, well, nothing for us to do. There's nowhere for us to go. And then the things eventually left. And, but they have described other things, large saucers. And again, I, I describe it like a James Cameron film because James Cameron's movie, The Abyss, had a lot of color. Um, it, just what they described sounded like they had just watched that movie and were just describing aspects of it to us. But, wow. As a, as a trained investigator, a trained interviewer, and, and even interrogator when it comes to the, the folks who have done things wrong, I, I dare say, I don't want to say I can tell when a person's lying, but I can tell when a person's entire manner is, is, is theatrical and nonsense. And these, these folks were telling us stories that were true and correct to the best of their knowledge. This was how they had experienced them, and they were fantastic. I can't say what they were. Well, it's why I'm more fond of UAP and uso and things like that because it covers what do you do with a multicolored dragon it's not a flying saucer <laughs> so does a person who yeah. studies ufos want to study that as well i would think they would it's a that's why i'm yeah. happier with phenomenon i know some people get upset and believe that the government has co-opted something i'll say ufo all day but i just happen to understand yeah. what the word flying means and flying indicates a certain means of get. you know just driving is a certain thing Flying yeah. is a certain thing. And if a thing is not exhibiting flight characteristics, I would rather call it a phenomenon. Yeah. Um, but it's, I can't get over what they're saying down there. And, and so at the northeastern tip of Guadalupe Island is what we have referred to before as, as a geomagnetic anomaly. Um, and the reason is because during that survey in 2018, the, the, the maps that we imported show a, a blurred out area of higher mag, higher magnetic um mm, polar, the geomagnetic activity yeah. i was going to ask you about this yeah. polarized in, in one direction more than the other more than the surrounding area and the two spots that we have on the map 150 miles due west of ensenada and one right off the tip of guadalupe where people have reported directly to us that uap were going in and out of the water correspond mm -hmm. to these anomalies and when i say anomaly they're anomalies in that they are different than the surrounding area for about a thousand square miles everything else on the map is of a certain uh polarized magnetic field and these areas are, are polarized very specifically towards the other the other end now i don't know exactly what that's going to mean but i have one of the things i discussed on the way out to the island um with Luis was the fact that during the early Holocene, when the when Guadalupe Island was formed, when the, the crust was moving and when these hot spots that formed the volcanoes were going, the very last place that that it formed was where this anomaly was. So the likelihood is that there's a lava tube there. What what we would consider an upwelling of lava towards the surface that eventually if it didn't break through, 
or, and didn't keep growing into an island, etc., that magma will eventually flow back down towards, you know, towards the mantle. And the possibility for that to be an evacuated, hollowed out space is, is pretty high. Um, so that, that, Sean, are you saying that, that these things have a base off the coast? I think that we should investigate that. If they're entering and exiting the same areas and these areas have the same geological um, structures in the area, why not send submersibles and find out at least? Um, or, or place vessels in the area to, to monitor this. So that's where I have questions for the United States government. It's been a long time since 2004. Now, I know yeah. just from talking to sailors and sailors' families and reading the local message boards here in San Diego that our ships are getting harassed still by UAP off the coast. Jeremy Corbell and others have tried to bring that to light with some things, and the debunkers have tried to tear them apart. Um, but it just it doesn't wash out at the end of the day for the debunkers because the United States Navy is still having trouble with unidentified objects in their airspace. And they're certainly not Chinese and they're certainly not Russian. Yeah. The water thing. I mean, I've been thinking about that more and more, like it just in general, like a conne connection between UAP and water bodies of water. And I've kind of mentioned it to a few people now, and it does seem like it's really a global thing. Like they, they, it's not just in certain areas they're attracted to the water. It's like all around. And yeah, could it be something like, like you say, like, is there some kind of base or something to do with that? Again, we're speculating, but we're just speculating based on the fact that, that there's an increased activity in these areas. There's also the fuel um, aspect that it's, it's, it's very likely that the technology they're using utilizes something along the lines of, of hydrogen or deuterium or, or something that can be cracked via electrolysis from, from, a, from water. So if water ends up providing a power source of some kind, they're obviously going to, going to utilize that. It's a great place to hide. You know, we, we, talk about the percentage of the earth that's covered with water but if you have a globe lying around the house spin it around there's there's a whole half yeah. of the other side of the earth is water we don't think of yeah. it that way we're kind of the mercator map slapped across half of the globe and the other half is basically water in oceana at the tip of australia so um where would you hide i'm not going to hide where the people are yeah and obviously in the sky, even if you can have low observability or whatever signature management, things like that, there's still a lot of people that on, you know, given, given the right circumstances can look up and point. But if you're deep in an ocean <clears throat> or a massive body of water, then yeah, as, as people have said numerous times, we know less about our oceans than, you know, I don't know about saying space. I don't really, even though they say that's true, I don't know if I agree with that, but we know less about our oceans than almost anything like, you know, like the, the moon or whatever. We, we know nothing compared Agreed. to the vastness that's down there in the, in the, the deep blue sea. Um, yeah, it's wild. That's why when we get to origins, I think that we should be very open-minded. We don't have to get fantastic and claim that, that anything's true, but these could have been here a lot longer than we have. They, they could have, and they could be administering to us. This might be their planet. And we might just be waking up yeah. to the fact that it is. And it's something we should be ready for. And not, I think not in the shake a spear at the other fashion that humans are used to, but perhaps in, in learning something new and opening ourselves up to something new. Yeah. But I mean, yeah, I don't know how confident I am. If we can't live in peace with ourselves, how are we going to do with the? Yeah, there's <laughs> no Neanderthals around to ask how how we did it last time. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, like I was going to ask you a few different questions around this topic, you know, like like dancing around disclosure and and transparency and what's happening, and and then I was planning that even before these shoot downs, you know, and then obviously the U.S. shot down a, a Chinese surveillance balloon, then they shot down three objects of which apparently we can't identify um and then in a total shocker nobody saw it coming they say we're not going to be able to recover the the debris what a surprise um so yeah i mean where are we what's happening is it is all this is all this positive in terms of getting greater transparency because i really i mean again it's similar to what we were saying with origins like we could sit here and speculate for hours i could sit here and i'm sure you could too and speculate for hours on 
why have why has this been handled in the way it's been handled because in the, in some ways it seems like they were being really open about things and in some ways it's like okay they're open and then they're evasive and then they're lying and then they're hiding and mm-hmm. and then they're open and it's it's just weird like, it's just weird like whatever whatever people think was shot down um it's weird so yeah just kind of give me your take on on everything that's happening so it our response doesn't make a lot of sense to me no one in um mm-hmm. in government is taking what I would call a leadership role in this, um, yeah. except for some senators and some congressmen who are who are pressing um, the issue. But the fact the fact is this: is that so Arrow was established, the the, the uh, and AARO. I don't remember what the acronym stands for, but basically the the what's going on with UFOs? Oh, domain on, anomaly resolution. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, domain anomaly resolution type. Um, but it's it's to figure out what's going on and report back to government and the people office is is essentially yeah. what it is. They have been given a, a an order to to reach back at the at a minimum of I think seventy years and research the entirety of this subject. Now that's going to take a while, but that has happened. the The United States government has acknowledged that UAP exists, have written into law establishing an office to study and report. It's not a question of whether they exist or not anymore. And when we say UAP, we are discussing perceived craft and phenomena exhibiting the five observables. Okay, so the debunkers and those other folks, they can find a new job or or wait until more information comes in and try to debunk it. But the fact is, is it does exist. Mm. Now, in the course of that, the the United States defense apparatus, NORAD, etc., have removed certain filters from the way that they report um, report contacts that are within their their web, so to speak. So what we've seen recently is those filters have come off, and something that we previously were not paying attention to are now showing up all over the place. Now, what are they? Now, in this case, what we've seen are Chinese balloons, one or perceived Chinese balloons that have been shot down. Shown, you know, it's obviously a balloon with a. a apparatus of some type on a gondola underneath it and we understand that we wrap our eyes around it and we're given a perception that the rest of them are like that we don't know why are we dispatching fighter jets and spending millions of dollars to shoot something down over the yukon if we don't know what it is and if it is just a balloon over the yukon who cares you let the other one float all the way across the continental united states you know there's nothing Mm -hmm. about this that makes sense other than Immediately, the filters came off, contacts popped up all over the place, and we responded in a pretty unprofessional way. First, we did nothing. Then we started shooting things down, thinking we were going to have a quick and easy answer to this. And the idea that we're, gonna, that we're not going to collect wreckage of something we shot down, what if there were people in there? What, mm-hmm. if, it, what if these weren't just somebody's high school project balloon which is now we're trying to be told oh somebody shot down a hobby balloon what you're seeing here i believe is perception management you've got what's actually happening and and it's happening in real time it's being reported and other people are jumping on top and they want to manage the perception of this thing to work right for them each case should be taken on a on a a case-by-case basis Um, I don't know what was shot down over the Yukon, if that was the the hexagonal shaped one or not, but that set. I think um, the the Yukon, is that the one in Canada? I think that is a cylinder. Right. That was a cylinder. I have a hundred questions about that because natural buoyancy of a cylinder. If it's a balloon, then it must have had some kind of apparatus to keep it horizontal if it was horizontal. If it was vertical, nobody's reporting vertical tic tac. Um, Well, that's that's actually, that's not quite true. Um, But. The fact is, is there's a lot of information that we could be given that would give us better answers. We're not being given that information. I can't believe that we had a military operation to shoot something down and haven't recovered it or made um, some kind of. And, and yeah, and the idea, I know how long it takes a ship to get there. I'm, I can't tell you where the closest Coast Guard base or anything else is, but the United States Coast Guard should have been able to be on scene with a law enforcement mm-hmm. recovery team or, or, or some kind of quick reaction team. They exist. And, and so I'm flabbergasted that we are spending this level of money, putting this level of possible destruction out there. I mean, shooting the first missile over Lake Huron 
if I'm and I'm, I believe I'm correct in this, both of these missiles were inert as far as the explosives went. But the first mm -hmm. AIM-9 that they shot at the at the balloon missed. So I believe I heard that. I'm well. gonna hope that there that that was detonated, you know, and, and destroyed mm -hmm. by by the by the telemetry station station. But at the same time, that debris fell somewhere. You know, these these are not the most professional safe operations we could be having over over American soil. And what's the reason for it? What are we really what assuming? We really... Assuming we're being told the truth, right? True. That's assuming that what they're saying is true. Because do you think, do, from your position, do you think it's really plausible? that they shot down three objects within a week or whatever, a few days, and don't find any debris from any of them. To me, that just seems, you know, it seems almost too far. Because like, I know I know it's that these areas are hard to access and I know the conditions and every... I spoke to somebody on my podcast that crossed the Bering Strait on foot. Mm -hmm. It's possible mm -hmm. to get to these places. Like, yeah. And you'd think when you've got everything at your disposal, like you, you run the country, the most powerful country in the world, you can have whoever you want going there. You can assemble the a team a mixture of coast guard marines special forces like do what you need to do to be able to know but and it's one thing to not tell us i understand there maybe there's a reason for that but to not want to find out yourself i just struggle with that well, i it, struggle it, with that it that, places the rest of us we're forced to speculate and if you talk to the ufo mm. folks they're going to go for ufo stuff if you talk to national security folks they're going to talk about something different um You've got people on both sides of the conversation saying, well, it's, it's a, there's no way we're going to be able to shoot down a UAP. Okay, hold on. Back up. Five minutes ago, you said they don't exist and they're not real. Now you're, exi now you're telling me that they are so awesome, we can never hit them. You can't just jump around the map to make it work for you. And the fact is, is we know that people have hit UAP before with, with current prosaic technology. So these, these are non-starters. It's it is it is very bothersome. It's very bothersome. It muddies the water across the board on the whole thing. But I think what we're going to find out is these these contacts they're not going away. Now mm. we have to remember, and other people in, in on some other talks I've given have been mistaken. I don't get into politics about this. I am not a politically motivated person. I don't like any of them. Um, but the fact is is that there were numerous balloon incursions during the last administration that were not reported to us. These balloon incursions have been immediately reported. I'm all for the reporting as long as it's not chaotic grandstanding and, and political theater. This smacks of political theater or the fact that the reporting apparatus just caught, got caught with its pants down when the filters came off. That or, I mean, yeah, they, again, there's just so many different ways to think of it, but it, it you've kind of laid it out really well it just blows my mind like all of it it just doesn't add up does it hopefully we will get more leak hopefully some stuff will leak about this um because again we obviously expected biden to say a few things in his speech i mean i personally and i'm sure you'd say but i didn't have high expectations at all of, of getting much information but even based on that i think we were pretty let down with what like he hardly even addressed any of this um well, yeah, there's a dereliction a of duty. Weeks. There's a dereliction of duty on the point of the United States government at this point. That it's it's if you have a fifty thousand foot view of the UAP problem over the last few years, it's pretty clear that the public affairs officers for the United States Department of Defense are not telling us what we're asking, what we want to hear. They're trying to control messaging behind the scenes around UAP. Their emails have been have been leaked out and FOIA that show that they're communicating with people that are that are sympathetic to their agenda of chaos and misinformation for some reason. Why? Mm -hmm. And why is this lean heavily on a very quiet Air Force? Why do we have a more vociferous yeah. Navy involved? And why is Congress forced to figure out what's going on like this? There should be a, a different level of accountability that's going on. There's something about this subject that we're still fighting to get most people to realize it's real. And the apparatus is 10 steps down in their gaslighting and nonsense still. And this has been going on for 70 years. It's just more complicated now because of how educated people are. Yeah. Why? I heard recently, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> um, Ross Coulthard, he said something recently about like, um, you probably heard it. I think it was the, a, a senior member of the Navy 
had had gone and told the president that basically the air force is lying to you they're hiding mm -hmm. stuff from you they're not telling you everything um have you heard anything about that from anybody you know or are you just kind of in general the same as uh, well me, that heard uh, that specific person making a report i don't know who that is um i have some speculation but i can say that at least on my side of the fence that belief is well known that the about about the the air force hiding stuff the air force is obfuscating the this issue at yeah. every chance they're given whether whether we go back to look at project blue book which it's it is a fact that aspects of project blue book continued mm -hmm. those are facts yeah. and then there are places you can look to find those to be facts but if you ask the dod public affairs officer they'll claim they don't know they don't have that information it's not going to be something that is ever proactively um taught to the public or that they're educated on and unfortunately most of us only know what we what we see on our television what the news tells us and what we read if you don't seek the information out you're not going to know it but since since world war ii i i could count on both hands the number of programs that have been started that began to achieve results and were immediately shut down and in most cases you can find its version in the black or its classified version or or its it's uh, the, the children of the program. Um, we now know the the OSAP, ATIP, UAPTF arrow ladder that we've just walked up. You've got people that want to yeah. say aspects of that didn't exist. Somebody didn't run it at this point. We're at arrow now. What about you? You know, track it back 70 years. Show me all the programs. You pull all the data out. The data corroborates. It's just that somebody keeps saying there's nothing to see here. Forget it over and over and over again and, and we're past that now so while the stigma might be dead on the hill or the stigma might be dead inside the pentagon and in certain circles of research it's still alive and well in the public it's still alive and well in the mm -hmm. media um and and in a great deal of leadership yeah it's still definitely alive i don't know about well i think maybe it's starting to get a bit sick and may i think we are starting to, to see things change i do i do feel like that i mean i don't know about you i think the the tides are changing um well but... the folks that want to see this fail have to understand something you can't when when you're done destroying you will have nothing the folks that are willing to build will always have something we we have we have truth we have evidence and and we have time so as long as those things are on our side i think we're going to eventually win but at the end of the day, I think this is going to be a question of, of personal polarity. And, and this will probably make some people mad, but I'll bet you you could determine whether or not someone believes in UAP as to how they feel about um, the golden rule and karma. If somebody is a positively polarized person who wants to make the world a better place and wants to give people the benefit of the doubt and hold love in their heart, I have a feeling you're going to find people that are more sympathetic to believing in this phenomenon. It seems that the colder and angrier and more shut off and selfish you are, the less likely you are to accept aspects of this. And I think that's because each one of us, you don't have to be a PhD philosopher or sociologist or, or guru to not come up with some of the follow on implications of this, that there might be more to this yeah. existence than just nine to five and a couple of beers at night and, and wash and repeat and do it, you know, do it every day. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the same thing could definitely be said for the topic. I, I think we should move on to briefly now. And that's like meditation mm -hmm. and, um, and, and obviously all the related topics, all the little branches coming out from the tree, like consciousness and, mm -hmm. and everything else. Um, I guess in, in like a 10 second answer, if I can give you one kind of on the spot question before we, before we talk about that, um, which one case other than obviously the Nimitz, mm -hmm. um, do you think was, is the most compelling case that, that we have of, something you know non prosaic something different something i would go right to the aerial school in south africa mm. it was yeah. it impacted so many people changed so many lives and and left so much evidence worth studying um that to me that's the most interesting one and the fact that the people are still affected to it this day very few people have changed their opinions on it. i would i would say aerial school 
Yeah, that's definitely a solid one. That, that I actually was going to ask if we if if I'd had a bit more time today, that was one of the things I was going to talk to you about in a bit more detail. And and I agree, that's actually for what it's worth. And People should watch Randall Nickerson's here, but... movie, um, uh, aerial, uh, aerial phenomenon or aerial school movie by Randall Nickerson is, is a fantastic movie. And Randall is a fantastic researcher and filmmaker. I highly highly recommend that. Cool. I'll put the link in the description for that. Um, and in case anybody's interested and doesn't maybe have time to watch that just yet, I did talk to Ralph Blumenthal about John Mack's work in that in that case um, a while ago. So I'll link that as well below because yeah. obviously John Mack was one of the first people there on scene and like, yeah, like yeah. spoke with all the kids. And An incredibly like prolific that. researcher um, in his own right. He was one of the best ever. Yeah. Yeah. He was fascinating. Um, and then, yeah, towards towards the end of his life, he started becoming more interested in, yeah, consciousness, what happens after we die. And so, yeah, onto the meditation. I think it was on your YouTube channel, which I don't think you've posted to yet, but but it's there. It's ready. Um, I've taken, <laughs> or maybe I've, you did before and deleted I've taken some stuff. My, I've taken my videos and other uh, personal social media private um, just because uh, some of the folks on that that uh, hardline opposition were taking those things and trying to change them into, you know, propaganda films and things like that. To, so uh yeah i took them down but but please continue um as far as meditation but yeah I, I was just saying in the about section i think you had down there like a meditation facilitator or something along those lines so i was just going to ask you if you can kind of share a little bit about how you got into that and yeah. and what that's all about from your point of view um and One whether second. you've kind of had any i, I guess lost a headphone let's see here oh wow that was weird it sounded like all of a sudden god was talking to me One like second. a okay. I don't know that now I'm back up. You can't hear me. Now I'm back up. Sorry. <laughs> okay. That was weird. It was like, God was talking to me for a second. It was like a voice in my head. I was like, what, what, who is this? Is this still short? Um, <laughs> Sorry about that. I, no, it's all good. Okay. So yeah. So about the meditation. Yeah. Just, just kind of talk to me a little bit about that and, and whether you've as well, whether you've had any kind of spiritual mystical experiences, any, whether you consider it a spiritual awakening, a transformative experience, just waffle for a few minutes, if you don't mind yeah. about, all of that kind of stuff so it was a few years probably a year and a half two years after i retired from the navy um i had when i had retired i decided i didn't want to work in defense anymore i didn't want to do anything violent or anything dynamic so i went to culinary school and, and began working as a chef um and that didn't work i was i enjoyed it i was good at it but it wasn't what i thought it was going to be and so I, I quit um, and I quit and I, I had just gotten out of the 20 years in the Navy. I was not a quitter. Um, it, it was, it was hard for me to be able to quit and to realize that I had quitting yeah. in me. Um, Bigger challenge than keeping on going, I guess, for you at that point. And it was shortly after that, my wife and I decided, you know, let's just take some time off, take about a year off. Let's figure it out, figure out what you want to do. And during that time, I started to experience really bad tinnitus. Um, at certain parts of the day, my ears would just start ringing like crazy and it was really bothering me and it was affecting my sleep and it was affecting other things. And in the middle of that, I had a dental issue. Um, I had a crown come off of a, and I had an exposed filling for about, about 18 hours, um, before I could get into emergency surgery. And I spent what I, what I still call the dark night of, of the soul for myself sitting up yeah. in a chair with a giant glass of ice water and very, very cold ice water that I'd even put um, salt in to make it even colder. And that was because my teeth, my tooth hurt so bad that the only way that I could make it better was filling my mouth with incredibly cold ice water, which was the most horrific pain initially that you could, that you could imagine. But after a moment, it would numb, and then I'd, I'd get about 15 minutes of relief. But I just kept doing that for a period for over over this night. And while I was sitting there, I was conscious. <sighs> and I, while sitting there that whole night, I realized aspects of my consciousness, of an interior realm that I hadn't noticed before. And I kind of made it through that night by utilizing aspects of that realm and there were aspects of it that reminded me of childhood that reminded me of a safe place i knew where to go to when i closed my eyes kind of thing so it wasn't getting easier for me 
it was getting harder. So I got the tooth fixed and the tinnitus was still killing me. So I started, um, I saw somewhere on Reddit that someone said that binaural beats were a thing that you could dial a frequency in and they might be able to at least kind of do some noise cancellation kind of thing with your tinnitus to give you some relief. So I started listening to binaural beats, not knowing anything about frequency, resonance or brainwave, you know, alpha, delta, et cetera, knew nothing. Um, And started having interesting experiences in consciousness while utilizing, like I just have weird stuff happen while listening to these binaural beats. That led me- Like visual stuff? Visual stuff, synchronicities, um, synchronicities mostly. Things, just coincidences started coming out of the woodwork, what, excuse me, woodwork like crazy. That yeah. was when I found Sam Harris. And at the time, I was pretty agnostic. Um, I don't fall into any religion. I guess I'm kind of a Zen Gnostic or Buddhist something or other. But um, But back then, I was way more of an atheist. And so I needed somebody who was going to tell me how this machine worked. And not worry about the other side until I experienced it. And I thought Sam was perfect for that. And he he felt about hallucinogens the way that I feel, that they're tools and they should be regulated and managed and, and therapy and all these other things fell in with it. So I was able to listen to him. So I finally sat down and began what people would call um, proper meditation. I did I did Sam's guided meditations. And then I'm one of those people that goes, okay, that's cool. But what is it you practice? I don't want to know what you're trying to teach me. I want to know what you do when you're, when you're at home. Sam was very into Dzogchen meditation. And Dzogchen is the great perfection of, of, of being, um, being in the stillness and in the now and just letting, letting it be. Mm-hmm. It really truly is letting what is be. And that resonated with me a great deal and so when i moved away from mantra or guided meditation and just sitting in presence um i just noticed that there was an interior realm and the interior realm seemed to extend in a cup in a direction that was both downward and infinite and upward and infinite um and my brain began to visualize it in an exponential way kind of like going down to the quantum um and and going up to the macro of whatever creation is and that we vacillated back and forth from from those places and that our our i I started noticing things that i knew were true that didn't seem to fit with a waking reality but were very valid when one's eyes were closed and one's focus was honed and honestly i think i was coming from it from a very selfish standpoint for for a very long time I was coming from it from almost a, how can I get more of these superpowers? How can I, how can I keep improving and, and succeed due to these abilities? And it wasn't until I was faced with a number of emotional setbacks of, of things that, that just took the, took the soul out of me and said, you're not going to get exactly what you want. You're going to have to deal with a world that was, that was different than your dreams. Um, there was an acceptance that came with that, that realized that it was going to be okay because of the basis of my essence was love. And that no matter where I turned in my life, if I was willing to give that I would receive. And there was a message that came through that just said, don't worry about it anymore. And it's, it's been a journey since that moment to get where I want to be. I feel like I'm getting closer all the time where I am able to accept the reality of things. I don't have to try to force the course of my, of my boat anymore. Um, I tell a story a lot that I think is, is the perfect metaphor for it. And that I was, I was sailing on the San Diego Bay with my wife and a friend of mine. We had um, a boat that was a little large. We had rented a boat that was rigged for racing. It was a little bit more than we could handle. And the wind was more than we could handle that day. And so we made our way out from the harbor underneath the bridge. We had tow boats almost or tugboats almost running us over, and it was a bad time. My wife was uh, was actually considering bailing, jumping out of the boat. And um, we took the sail down, fired up the outboard, and just made our way back to the harbor. And we got about three quarters of the way back to the harbor, and I'm exhausted. My arms are killing me because 
turning this boat is just the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. And my, my friend finally puts his hand on my shoulder and says, Sean, unlock the, or take your hand off the engine and put it on the tiller. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, look what you're doing to the boat. Because I was turning us into the harbor and I was going like this, leaning on it. I was bending the whole transom. I was, I was pulling on the outboard motor and bending the whole back of the boat to change its course. When I should have just pulled the pin on the tiller and easily moved it back and forth. But I, my adrenaline and my lack of focus was, I was screwed. And yeah. I couldn't, and that was the perfect metaphor for my life that I lived up until the point where I began meditating because I was getting a lot of the results I wanted, but man, was I forcing things the whole way when all I needed to do was simply put a finger on the tiller and, and move it back and forth a little bit. We get in our own way so much and we're so afraid. We, we all feel so alone. We're concerned that we're not loved, that we're not loving properly that we're not getting enough that someone else has more than than what we have or they have something we felt we deserved and we're all in pain and i think it's a ruse you don't have to be and it, it comes yeah. down to first the choice i choose to be happy and it's not the same for everybody some people have chemical imbalances some people's wires are stripped so far there's just too many other signals coming in for them but our visualization, our intent, and our ability to, to feel what is here in the center of your chest, whether you, whether it's metaphysical or just a blood pump to you, it is the it is truly the heart of you. No, pun, there's there's no pun or joke about it. It's 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 your heart and your heart. And what we feel in that place, it knows what to do. And if if we can take our ego's shame and guilt. And peel it back just long enough to know that we are all the same. Yeah, some of us are worse than others, especially on paper or, or in, a, in a society. But every single person here is, is a human being now. And it's that simple. And it seems like everything around us is that simple. We've been given a world that appears complicated, and it's not. Um, yeah. I think meditation teaches us that. And at the, at the risk of talking way too much as I usually do, the folks that say, well, I can't meditate. Meditation doesn't work for me. They usually go on to, to list a number of tasks that do work for them. And I promise you, meditation works for you. Those tasks are a crutch, but they're the thing that should inform you that if I can distract myself enough from this life, I can meditate just fine. And intuition comes through and spirit comes through. So don't be afraid to try sitting down on your butt or lying down or sitting in a chair, and looking up and focusing on whatever you see or, or your breath or a mantra. It, it might not have worked the first few times, but you didn't get buff going to the gym one day. You didn't see any results when you came home that, that you know, the first 50 times. So, yeah, that's, that's so valuable. I appreciate you saying all that. That's uh, kind of speaking to me a little bit. I needed to hear all that as much as probably half the people that are listening. Um, but yeah, we do, we get in our way a lot and, and I hope, yeah, I've heard from a lot of people now that as you're saying, meditation can heal a lot of that and allow you to get out of your own way and can allow you to see things differently. Um, so I guess then on, on that note, I'd also, I'd love to hear about some of yet yeah, was, was there like a first time when 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 you were meditating it's hard to get the words right with these sure. isn't it when you were meditating uh, when you first kind of started meditating was there ever like a moment an experience where like wow this is yeah different like i've hit a new level yeah so this tattoo on my arm right here um let's see if i can get it around for the camera <laughs> it's kind of it's uh <laughs> yeah yeah it's it's um now, of course, my brain's going to go completely blank right now. Um, it's a Celtic knot. It's an infinite knot. Yeah. Um, but I had been meditating, utilizing Dzogchen for probably three months. And I was sitting on my deck. I, I was wrapped in a blanket on my, on my cushion. It was probably about five o'clock in the morning. Um, 
I heard a gong and I saw this emblazoned in my psyche in gold. Wow. And it was the first time that I had ever, I don't, I'm not a very visual person on the interior. When I dream, it's in technicolor, but that's dreaming. If I close my eyes, it's black. Um, if I summon up a visualization of something, it both is there and is not. I can, I know what colors they are, but I don't, I don't see like that lion on your, on your wall behind you. When I visualize it later, I will see it, but I won't see, I won't be, I don't know if I'll be able to tell you what colors or what, or I'll know it was kind of blue, but I won't see it the same way. I'm not very visually, um, it's not, it's not very dynamic in there for me. So anytime I notice something in the blackness of the void, it's, it's very telling. And it's things that started coming through in gold and that's another color i didn't understand and they were all involving um philosophical or or spiritual concepts um and of course i i understand how, that my my subconscious has probably seen every symbol that there is out there yeah um, and encountered numerous concepts that I'm not able to recall or that I'm not familiar with. So I understand epiphanies are often because the brain has swept together a certain amount of, you know, garbage off the floor and, and, and said, look what I made. And, um, and, and the heart goes, yes, <laughs> yeah. yes, we made that together. But these were very different. It felt like something more was coming through. And so for me, that, that golden light and that that noise that gong that i don't know what it was but i started searching more for that energy and for me and in, in my own personal space it feels like i found a place to go have a conversation with somebody that i trust implicitly uh somebody that that is never going to say steal the cookie they're always going to say look around for who's hungry and break it in half and it yeah. became a person that I trusted, frankly, more than anybody else. And it's really hard to explain because you're not sitting on a couch talking to someone else and you're not talking. It's a, uh, and it's you, it's your inherent goodness. It's your center. It's the thing that, that knew what it was doing before you took your first breath this time. Um, yeah. And that will know what it's doing when you take your last your inner self, higher self, consciousness, yeah. soul. Yeah, source. Yeah. You know, a lot of people like to call it different things. Some people, I think, end up, I think people with a lack of certain self-esteem end up calling it their guides or their or other things. But mm -hmm. but I'm convinced, see, I'm convinced I'm you. I'm convinced you and I are 100% the same water in two different containers. And those containers don't allow us to see each other's water. And we don't we don't realize that there's not a single difference in our chemical makeup. Um, I believe that it gives me, it makes it a little easier on the days that someone's trying to step on my toes or punch me in the face. Um, not always. Yeah. Um, but that, that the way that we're talking right now turns off a lot of people, people who, who have, have not received felt love and validation and haven't, haven't crested that hill of themselves yet can be very turned off when people talk about love and support and caring. And they think that's weakness. Yeah. They don't understand. Weakness is a lack of fear or excuse me, mm. excuse me. That's, that's the opposite of what I'm trying to say. What I'm trying to say is weakness is the absence. Or, <laughs> no, I'm doing it again. <laughs> I'm trying to reach a place of an absence of fear. I feel that fear yeah. is a weakness that holds me back. It would be weak for us to not touch on on these sensitive and and emotionally charged topics just because some some tough guy over there that goes to the gym every day is going to tell us, "Oh, you guys suck. You, you guys are little like." You don't leave the house carrying a spear because you're unafraid. Yeah, you're, there is something out there. You may have brought yourself to a place of courage to go fight the thing you're afraid of with that sharp stick, but the fact is, is you are afraid. And that's a hard thing for a lot of people to accept, especially when they're clutching a, a spear to them, whether it's a philosophical or a literal spear. And they're saying, no, this makes me strong. So it, it's, it's always harder 
to accept that love and patience means you're going to accept you're going to experience more pain if you if you if you choose to accept that polarity there might even be more pain in your life than there was before but the way that you experience it is vastly different than the way that you did before it's um yeah i mean we we could talk truly for hours about how hard it is to love each other and how much we're begging yeah. each other to do it. Yeah. And how we're so far away from 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 doing that really. And like further than maybe ever mm -hmm. in in human history potentially. Like I I don't know, I haven't been there the whole time, but it feels like everything is so divided at the moment and so polarized and I used to be able to go grocery yeah. shopping or leave the house or just to leave the house and go out in public and do what we all do. And get home at the end of the day without having heard anyone's political opinion, without having experienced mm -hmm. anyone's rage or anger. And my wife and I were talking last night after we went grocery shopping. We were just shocked at the amount of people that were interacting in a negative fashion with the other people around them. That weren't choosing to smile and say, good afternoon, how are you? Or what you're going to make with that that's in your cart. But they, it was just constant judgment constant rudeness furrowed brows angry people mm -hmm. and we had just come from something that was uh very calming and chilled us out we were in a great mood and it was just one of those where we realized that you know most of the time we're one of those folks yeah why well, what the hell are we all so preoccupied with um it's i this is not the world i expected to be at on the cusp of 50 years old I didn't expect to be <laughs> wallowing in philosophy and um, and these these big ideas. I figured I'd be living the mundane muggle existence with everyone else, you know, armchair football game, yeah. barbecue on Sunday, and I don't want that. Yeah. Um, I want more of what I feel in my heart, which is we're on the cusp of something amazing. Um if we can get out of our own way. Yeah. If only there was a way to, to help everybody else wake up. I mean, everybody, again, I don't want to get too sidetracked and I don't want to get political and everything yeah. like that. And like, there's a few more things I want to talk about, but like, I just feel people these days, it's, it's all about, you know, oh, right and left. And it's basically everything is boiled down to red team and blue mm -hmm. team. And it's the same in the UK as it is in America. I mean, obviously there are many differences, sure. but that's what it boils down to. And the everyday people don't seem to realize that if you follow the, the ladder up high enough and you, you follow the money and you follow everything like that, basically the same people, mm -hmm. you know, either way that are going to be, nothing materially changes, mm -hmm. whether it's the red team or the blue team that gets in power. It, it, yeah. Yeah, it could be a bit better. Yeah, we might, you know, get this particular personality out of here who's mad and we don't like him. But in general, over a, if you step back in the bigger picture, it's all just noise, mm -hmm. really. Well, if, we, the, if we take the fact that we take Facebook for example, and I, I will, I'll pick on. They're easy to pick on. They're they're a monolith. They're huge. Yeah. But all of us should know at this point that if you've been on Facebook in the last ten years, your data was sold to a company that used it to manipulate all of us globally in a political fashion. Why are you still on Facebook? Yeah. And I, I don't think it, it's not about, you know, Facebook and going, you know, get rid of Facebook, go to the gym, drink water. You know, this isn't Reddit <laughs> and, and that's, and life's not that simple, but are you willing, where do you draw the line? In what you're willing to trade for your convenience? You know, I've, I'm, I'm the first person to admit uh, I'm ashamed how this was created. I, I've, yeah. I know that people died. I can't believe I'm saying this in such a nonchalant fashion. People died mining lithium for this phone. And that's, that's just the start. And what the hell is going on? Like, I don't, yeah. I don't think I'm better than anybody else, but I can at least wrap my head around the fact that I suck because I, I am co-opting. 
that that level of of, of human slavery and 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 th that horrific treatment. But I don't know what the hell to do about it because, like I said, you know, am I am I a better person if I have a flip phone? You know, the, these the, it's such a convoluted road. Any one of us can run down, and all it says is it's trying to tell us we're not good enough. And the only people saying they're good enough, frankly, are the ones that are holding the whip. Yeah. They're convinced they're all, they're just fine, you know. So, yeah, we're back to what is this reality? You know, what? Why are we here? What are we meant to do? And I am I am convinced in my own right that um, or, or what's helped me wrap my head around it is you know simulate. A lot of people talk about simulation theory. I think that that's fine to talk about as long as you're understanding that a painting is a simulation, but it is a painting. You know, a, a motion picture is a simulation, but it exists in its own yeah. right. So if this is what you consider a simulation, it still exists in its own right. It is still happening. Uh, you know, prick me, do I not bleed, etc. But what are you choosing to do with it? Uh, where Where do you... Why are you doing the things you were doing? I'm not trying to get anybody to quit their job or sell their house or leave their husband or anything like that. But I, I, if I could find a way to ring a gong for the whole world and just give them 10 seconds of clarity and go, are you being the way, the person you want to be? Are you acting in accordance with your heart and with, with any kind of perceived plan you have? And if you're not, when will you change direction? Because we're we're all in this together, literally. It's there's yeah. whatever this is. Number one, don't assume that the management stops at some level above us. I, I assume that that nature is red in tooth and claw in this reality, and it extends all the way up to the top. There's going to be selfishness at every level, and there's going to be love at every level, probably. Because I think that's what this this universe is made of. It is polarized, positive or negative. Yeah. Everything is, you know, we're all waves and particles at the same time. That's going to confuse some people, but but we are. What are you going to yeah. choose now? We, we've all got to try and be better, right? It's like it's hard, isn't it? Like you said about the iPhone and stuff like that. Like, yeah, I, I have the same thing, and I'm aware of the same thing of you and. I guess there's there's two sides to it these days and one side is people need to take more responsibility individually but then at the same time it's made so hard for people these days particularly people that are less well off people that are not you know financially not in a great situation it's impossible like if if you're somebody that's struggling every month to to stay afloat you have no choice but to buy your tomatoes from the other side of the world and and all your food coming in like plastic within plastic within plastic imported from who knows where and picked by again like vulnerable children or whatever in in a country where they're forced to people don't realize like how far it goes like again not to blow my own trumpet or anything but we try me and my partner try our best you know to like research where do these where does this vegetable come from how you know is that we try and buy local try and buy seasonal things like that we still have plastic waste and it sucks you know i hate throwing away all of this single use plastic and everything but we try to minimize it and i don't know i don't even know where i'm going with this really. well, it's I, just frustrating it's very <laughs> simple to see the various traps if you can see first of all most of us don't see the our own trap that we're in. but i can i can hmm. look at someone who is who is for whatever reason stuck in a low income situation forced to eat things like fast food every day or things like, because frankly they can't afford a higher caloric density you know and that that fast food engenders things like diabetes and arteriosclerosis and now they're in the you know and now as someone who is again th this all sounds political but it's not because i don't that's because everything is everything everything these has days, been isn't polarized it? but the fact yeah these people are now now you can't afford good food now you need insulin and we can go into the argument over the fact that that's unaffordable and that's ridiculous. Mm. Everywhere we turn, someone is taking advantage of us. And we have been taught that we should feel proud of that because we're capitalists. And capitalists built this, yeah. this free enterprise and, and this free world. We allied post-World War II countries 
live in. And it's like, hold on a minute. There's, there's a lot more world besides us. Yeah. And when I look at how much, you know, I'm not proud of the fact that my country uses more than they give back. You know, when I look at the, the, the resources that go to certain areas of the world, it, it's crazy. And yeah. I wish we could find a place where it wasn't political. I just want to hear everybody in the room go, that's kind of messed up. Let's start there with that's kind of messed up. And, and when we can move out from there, I'm not pointing at anyone. It's like everybody is, everybody's waiting to get accused of being the problem. Everybody's got a whole script of how they're going to say it's not them, it's them. And everybody just needs to take a, a big, deep breath and step the heck back. Because we're not making any decisions together anymore. We're, 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 we're disattached, yeah. like get like remove the attachment to the teams, the red mm -hmm. team, blue team, mm -hmm. the 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 political celebrities, you know, the, all of that. Just step back from that mm -hmm. and and look at it again. UAP is supposed yeah. to do that for all of us. We're all supposed to, whether threat or savior, we're supposed to look at this thing and say, oh yeah, we're we're the team first. Now let's all step forward together and figure it out. But the people here have been told, no, 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 no. They're your saviors and they're here to kill your enemies or, or they're your, your good people, but they're not, they're here to get rid of the bad people or, and, it, and it's yeah. like, I don't think it's going to be any of those things. I, no. It's going to be something hard to comprehend. How do you is, hurt people hurt people? We, we've heard that a bunch, whether it's a quip or not, but it's true. And the first 10 times you do something nice for a hurt person, they still hurt you back because it's their reflex. I don't know. If we could figure out how to manufacture compassion and give it to people, I would. If there was a frequency yeah. we could play that would get people to take a minute and, and have a little compassion, I would. Um. But I feel like forced meditation. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, I mean, no, seriously. Like, I, well, I, that's another thing too. Is, is I'm not, I'm not a fan of dictators. So even if somebody did have a solution, can't input that. Can't, yeah, you never. You can't do it to... without everybody's buy-in. We're, you know, we're all sovereign individuals at some level. So yeah. I don't know if we're all here to learn how to be better. Cool. That's that's what I have tried to choose to do um in an unironic non-egoic fashion when i when i keep bumping into my ego i try to pay attention um yeah. progress not perfection you know uh, maybe it never gets easier you know maybe it's gonna it's gonna look yeah. like it does here and we're all gonna recycle back through the thing until we each escape perhaps or maybe i'm wrong about the whole thing and i'm just a i'm a blip and this is all i get I don't think so. I think uh, the evidence that that I'm aware of suggests more, like like you say. Um, let's talk about your. You mentioned it earlier. Let's kind of we'll, we'll, we'll leave that for now. We'll cut, another day. We'll we'll put the world to rights again. And I feel like we have a lot in common on that. In fact, um, so yeah, we could probably talk about that for quite some time. And uh, yeah, um, so you mentioned earlier about right at the start, pretty much of our conversation. I think it was close to the start about going to the Monroe mm -hmm. Institute. You just kind of mentioned it in passing. And obviously that pricked my ears up because I'm fascinated about that. So that's, um, again, you can probably tell people better than me, but it's basically an institute where they assess, they, they scientifically assess or, or evaluate things to do with psychic functioning, psi abilities and probably consciousness and, and all sorts of maybe other things. Um, but yeah, please, uh, please share if you're happy to. Yeah, the Monroe Institute. Um, geez, are they in West Virginia? Oh man, I don't have my details on on where they're located. But but anybody who wants to Google them can find out their their exact location. But in the '60s and '70s, a um, an acoustical engineer named Robert Monroe um, basically had an out of body experience um, uh, while n not during a um, a near death experience. And it bothered him, bothered him enough to go to his doctors and ask them what happened. He had a full, he was like a lot of us observed the process as it occurred and tried to explain it and understand it mm -hmm. and couldn't and went on to form what is now called the Monroe Institute. Um, 
developed what we now call binaural beats. He was one of the, if, if not the pioneer, one of the very early pioneers of that. And other things wow. to include white noise, brown noise, and other things that helped facilitate what he had gone through naturally. Um, mm -hmm. And for folks that don't understand that astral projection is something that people actually practice and that has a, a means of getting there uh, via meditation, what most of us would call meditation, might be really surprised. But if a lot of us think about the fact that have, if you've had a lucid dream, if you've woken up in the middle of a dream and said, holy crap, I'm dreaming, that's very similar to a to an out of body experience or an astral projection. It's a it's consciousness being outside of your body, seeming to have control and and noticing the environment, but your body's over there and noticing things in the environment that you can corroborate once you're awake again. Um so when Robert Monroe formed this this institute, the CIA, the military, and a few other people sent re or a few other organizations sent representatives there to study what he was studying reports were done the cia reports have been declassified um so all very interesting stuff to me i had studied it i had i i pirated the um their meditation tapes years ago and utilized them mm -hmm. something called hemisync which utilizes binaural beats to sync up the left and right portions of the brain and they've shown that these things are actually happening in the laboratory they have they've they've done the the research show the ekg evidence um, that they take people from a brainwave state of beta which i'm in now will take them down into alpha and then into theta which is um on the borderline of sleep and it's a place where we're able to gain um wisdom and intuition and other things from our what some people call a subconscious and what i feel is something non-local something that may be somewhere else that's my origin or something so uh yeah. long story short on that I got invited to participate in a um, in a in a private group at the Monroe Institute. They shut the institute down. There were nineteen of us, all of us um, lifelong experiencers of the phenomenon. Uh, some people that were there are um, psychic mediums by trade. Some people were filmmakers. Some people were ex-military. I can tell you a few of the people that I was there with um, were Chris Bledsoe, um, Randall Nickerson from the Aerial, Aerial School film. Um, and what we were there doing was essentially going through the Monroe program like a, a paid person would. But the folks at the Monroe Institute had developed things specifically for us. They had developed a specific program for the 19 of us. There were symposiums each day. We were meditating together. There were telekinesis demonstrations and training. Those were very interesting. Um, there were results. And while I'm, while I'm not a scientist, I am, a, I am an investigator and a pragmatic person. The results that we saw were not explainable to me via normal means. Um, the mm -hmm. people that, were, that bent spoons, for example, um, to include myself, did so in a way that they were not able to do just with their mere strength moments before, no matter how hard they tried. Um, to me, it showed the power of intent, but it showed how subtle the power of intent is also. But if the power of intent is subtle in an individual, I, how exponential does it become when it's practiced by a group? Well, we, we worked on some of those things. We attempted as a group to utilize telekinesis to move a soccer ball. We were unable to do that. Um, as a group, we did some other things. We, we attempted group, um, astral projections on numerous occasions. Some people reported success. Some people reported encountering the other people who reported success. So these are anecdotal experiences, but keep in mind, you're, you're amongst a group of people that after the first couple of days, we got to know each other. Nobody needed any more attention than anybody else. Nobody was going to make anything up. We were all failing left and right. We were there for a reason. We were we were as scientific about this as we could. So when we were having sessions of people doing group meditations and mantras trying to initiate um, contact, we had people 100 yards out, full sensor suites recording the whole thing, radar, infrared, everything, video, audio. And so... 
if we perceived contact of some kind, you know, for example, we thought we were seeing UAP, there were people present to immediately quality check that. Now, in the beginning, some people who have different ideas about it were upset that the they felt that the, the scientific folks were debunkers. They said, well, you, and we got into an argument about intent and perception. Because an example would be the ISS is coming up over the horizon. There's a, some of us in the group who have been approaching this in a scientific way long enough. We know when the ISS is coming up. We recognize it immediately. We know our satellites from our airplanes, from our debris. We have the apps to track them. Um, some folks who are more interested in the, um, the heartfelt side felt that we were ruining the experience. But it was, it was tough because they felt that like if we called out the ISS, we messed with their intent. And it was messing with their connection. I can't argue with that per se, but I but I said, but we still have to note what's what. So are you going to feel better at the end of the night when you are trying to tell people what you felt? But the people are telling, well, that profound feeling you felt was for Booster 67 Bravo that has, is a piece of space debris that comes over every 14 hours. You know, that's and so we got into arguments about perception. And I felt like that was useless. But what we what we truly did show, um, I think more than anything, what I saw over that week were people doing their best to be their best. You had 19 people who in one way or another, whether they would admit it or not, thought that what they have seen, experienced, or knew was the truth. There were 19 different flavors. Some people at PhD level access, some people highly placed in the military or government service, but everybody had to come down to a, to a, a midline or else it wasn't going to work for any of us. And as a group of people, what I saw was that most certainly we are more than this physical body, but whatever we call ego and whatever we call pride is something that keeps us from being everything that we can be. And at the end of the week, we had no great conclusions. We had um, we had done some scientific experiments and that were documented to the best of our ability that the results were negligible. And the fact is, is that most of us will never go on to talk about how little we did accomplish. There was there yeah. no saucer landed. No one stepped out of a portal. None of us had more than anecdotal evidence we could bring back beyond a few aberrant EKG readings, which were very interesting in my opinion, but they're not my, my place to talk about. They weren't my readings. Um, but I, I, that doesn't mean to me that, that we didn't need a, a watershed event that week. Um, I yeah. think what we really needed was for the people in that room and for the people at the Monroe Institute to see just how diverse this topic is just how differently it affects each person and, and frankly, how different our conclusions come out of it. Wow. Must've been an incredible experience. I'll never forget it. It was one of the best times of my life. Um, I met some really incredible people and I'll, I'll be, what's really funny is, is I have not maintained communication with the other 18 folks. I found it too hard. The week that yeah. we were there, we were too close. We did find group cohesiveness after a couple of days. There was, it was beautiful. Um, but when we left, we all went back home. We all went back to our jobs. We all went back to our families. And it's it wasn't the same. And I was like, I, I personally didn't want to pretend. And I've got way too many chats on Signal and WhatsApp, et cetera, every day anyway. Um, I stay in touch with a couple of folks, but uh, it's almost too hard to get into in-depth conversations with them because I can't get back to where we were. And we had, we seemed like we had, we had an accord. We were, we were, we were very lucky and blessed to be where we were with the beautiful environment, the comfort, the food, the scenery, and of course, all of the meditation and positive vibes. Um, yeah. But I'm still lost with how do we maintain a society or, or what should a society or a culture be um, 
because there's so much there that we we could all be doing that would make our lives better. I don't know how important it is to have a cruise ship or a or a tall building or a space station anymore. Mm-hmm. I don't know if we need all of the, or or a computer or a phone. Um, it yeah, makes Focus me sound like a big hippie, places. which I'm not. You know, no. But it, yeah. Not to me. I mean, some people w- will see it that way, no doubt. But to me, it just seems like you kind of you got your priorities in the right order, and you you realize that there's more to it than TV and fast food and snacks and yeah, our, our consumerism and and we need everything now. We need this instant gratification, and yeah, you've kind of grown past that. Um, but yeah, we again we we could talk about all that kind of thing for so long. Um, just tell me in a in a super brief answer because you mentioned you successfully bent a spoon. Mm. I've spoken to quite a few people now on this show that because again that's obviously something that seems ridiculous sure. to most people listening. To me, a year ago that would have seemed ridiculous. So two years ago it would have seemed unbelievably ridiculous. And now I've spoken to quite a number of very credible PhD scientists, doctors that have either done that themselves or have been around people that have done that. And the, and or they they know what people well that they trust implicitly and have great respect for that have done that and as much as we can't explain it or anything like that and it's not just spoons as, as well it's kind of obviously different metals and things like that but it seems as crazy as it is that these words leave my mouth it seems like it, it's a real phenomenon it seems like this is something that fits in with everything else like this this again it seems ridiculous but it seems to be real so again the question I was going to ask is did how did it feel for you like were you did you physically move it with your hand and it just went it just it kind of like putty or did it did you manage to bend it just by looking at it or what was that for you again just in a nutshell so i actually i have a fork sitting here because my i was eating before we got on this um call um the, i bent a fork and a spoon and i'll tell you the first one i felt was was silly i so we had a couple and we tried to do everything we could. This is one of my nice cutleries. Mm-hmm. I think if I if I went past here, I could bend it with all of my strength. Yeah. So I said to myself, well, I'm not I don't want to do it that way for the experiment because I think I'm strong enough to do that. Um, I decided I wanted to to bend one of the tines with my finger. So I held held it like this while yeah. we went through the stuff. And I still believe because I can feel this tine moving on this. This is a very high quality piece of cutlery. I think I brute force moved the time. I mean, I'm a, I'm six, two, I'm not, you know, muscle bound, but I'm stronger than your average guy, I guess. Um, so I was bothered by it. I didn't think it was happening for me. I wasn't feeling it. And then it just wasn't working. I was giving up. And one of the facilitators brought out a bunch of pendulums and pendulums are something I had worked with before in my own practice as a interface with the subconscious. I knew how they worked, Mm -hmm. whether you believe in it or not, or whether you believe it's fully influenced by the movement of your fingers, it doesn't matter because we're all, we're dealing with the same thing here, trying to talk to ourselves. And she said, if it's not working for you, maybe use the pendulum. She was teaching people how to use it to ask one of the forks or spoons in front of you if they would bend for you just this once. And I asked the fork and it said no, according to the pendulum. And I asked the spoon and it said yes. And I got I because I, I felt disappointment at the no, and then I felt th- thrilled at the yes, and so I had to take a second and go, "You're way too wrapped up in the emotion of this. You have way too much at stake here." And then I kind of said to myself, "But the spoon said yes, so what are we going to do?" And so we had been doing subtle ways of doing it, the way that most of us would be familiar with Yuri Geller or somebody else, where they're just just bending right here and it it just looks like it's melting well yeah i wasn't i i didn't think that was possible like even if i've seen other people do it and i've even handed someone a a spoon and had them do it to that spoon and was just like i still don't know if that's possible i still think you pulled one over on me but what i wanted to do (laughs) was twist it because i know for a fact that i can't do that not with my strength yeah so we did what was called the gorilla technique We jumped up in the air. We put all of our intent into it while in the air. And when we landed, we looked at what we had. 
I jumped up with the spoon. It's in a drawer upstairs. And I twisted it. And it twisted in the middle uh, all the way around. And I landed. And I had a feeling in me that I can't explain. It was like there was a smile that was taking up my whole being. Yeah. Now, when I landed on the ground and looked at that and felt that, the next thing I felt was pride. And I almost, I went to hold that spoon out and I went to, I was going to drop it on the table and let it clang like you're dropping the mic. Like a microphone. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and something in me said, if you do that, you will never hear from us again. And I was like, yeah. And I sat down and then I kind of hid the spoon and then kind of looked around and it, we could go into a whole other conversation about what happened after that. Not everybody in the room got to bend one. Not everybody at home was appreciative when I showed it to them. Um, some people have a very visceral, visceral reaction to that. It's yeah. The paranormal in your face messes with a lot of people. Um, mm. Now, in in ten seconds, I'll tell you. I think, I think everything in this universe is entangled. I don't think there's a great mystery. Yeah, I think good. every single atom, photon, proton, neutron, etc., is entangled. I think at some point we were probably. I'm not worried about. I, the Big Bang might have been real. Maybe it wasn't. I don't know. My my ring was created in a supernova. It's platinum and gold. Most of my elements were created. All of my elements were created in stars. So it doesn't surprise me that we're all entangled. And if we are, maybe every once in a while, I can ask a spoon to do something special. Yeah. What can we all do together? What are we manifesting right now with our ignorant beliefs on entanglement and intent? If I'm correct that intent can change the world, what is haphazard misinformed intent doing to it right now? Yeah. Turn on the news. It's not good. <laughs> wow. Thank you for sharing that, You're Sean. Welcome. I really, welcome. really appreciate that. That was, uh, I'm going to go and try the jumping up and down thing in a minute. And, uh, you know, I've obviously spent some time with the spoon. I haven't done it yet. I have to say, it all like, came I keep from hearing here. these people talk. I, and, and I'll yeah. tell you that the re that I, I said, I'll never try again. There was a lot in my heart when I jumped up in the air. There was a promise in me. I'll never try again. I just want to know, and I'll believe you. I'll believe whatever you tell me. And a lot of people think that's crazy. But in that moment in the air, I think my body, the universe, everything went, he's not, he's not full of it right now. He's really never going to try to do that. Like, I'll never try to do that for anybody else. Somebody goes, bend a spoon, Sean. No way, man. I only needed to do it once, and that was for me. You don't want to believe me. You you yeah. don't have to. You don't have to. I made a yeah. deal, and I'm sticking with it. Yeah. And the thing you said about the smile that that took over your whole yeah. body. As much as I've never had an experience like that, I can picture. I can feel exactly what you mean. I because I, I can put myself there. Like if I managed to do it with the spoon, I just I could just feel how that would feel. I'd be like, oh. I have to say, it taught shit. me so much that my next instincts was my next instinct was selfish grandstanding. That was probably the biggest yeah. thing that I took home from the Monroe Institute was in the moment that I got the thing I wanted, I'm obviously still bruised enough that I needed to yell, hey, look at me. And that's not what I want. Yeah. It would take an impressive person, I guess, to have got so far away from any ego to, to not even have that thought into yeah. the mind because, yeah, it's a very normal response, I think. Um Anyway, look, I've taken up more than enough of your time. Before I let you go, is there any kind of last words or a message or words of wisdom or whatever you want to say to everybody that's watched and listened? Um, at the risk of ruining uh, a recent or a spoiler alert for a recent Marvel movie, um, there was a line in it with a silly <laughs> character that people know it once they see it. Um, but the character said to the other one, it's never too late to stop being a dick. Yeah. And I believe so much in that because I, if I was one of the people that I was that, if you were one of the people that I was a jerk to in my past, I'm sorry. Um, but it's my intent to not be that way anymore. And that's the choice that I made. And I have to be humble enough to say I was a jerk and I probably will be again. But that 
choice and polarity is the very first step into changing your whole life and to reducing so much pain and discomfort and strife in your life and in your head and in your heart that just saying from here on out, I intend to be good is the most powerful thing I think a person can do for themselves because that part of you will never let you down if you tell it that you believe in it. And you're probably going to convince other people to try to not be dicks as well. So, so it's just going to dominoes effect. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I echo that. And that's, it's valuable advice. Thank you again. Thank Sean. You, just massively appreciate it. You've been super generous with your time and, and sharing your experiences, some of which some people are no doubt going to laugh at and, and, you know, take out a context or say it didn't, you know, it's, he misinterpreted it, but they're real experiences. And, and I just appreciate you so much. You sharing them. I really I've do. held back a lot over the last few years because the subject demanded uh, serious discussion, pragmatic discussion, and we didn't need to confuse anybody. Now that this has been established in, in law and, and the United States government is utilizing proper oversight on it, I see no reason not to share some of the things that are more esoteric or strange that I've been through because I know I'm not the only one. Um, yeah. People need validation for these things to find clarity. So I'd like to help in any way yeah. I can with that. I appreciate you giving me the platform. Yeah. Thank you, Ben. No, my pleasure. Thank you, and, and I look forward to the next time you already. Too. Take care. Bye. Cheers, Sean. Thanks to Sean Cahill for talking with me, and thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed our conversation. Please see the description for relevant links and more info. Consider subscribing to continue unraveling the universe with us. And if you want to really help us, please remember you can do so via Patreon. Thank you.